evacuations now underway and states of emergency issued in the Gulf Coast region as a deadly hurricane takes aim at Texas and Louisiana, expected to make landfall tomorrow as a major category three. Republicans making their move night two of the RNC. The best is yet to come. After a first night filled with tributes to the president and dire views of the future with Biden as president, tonight three members of the Trump family take to the stage. State of emergency in Wisconsin, the family of Jacob Blake pleads for an end to violent protests and the new video that appears to show a possible struggle with police before Blake was shot multiple times in the back. Race for a treatment, the head of the FDA now apologizing for overselling the benefits of plasma therapy while standing with the president. A gut-wrenching tragedy. The wife of a police officer found dead inside his police vehicle, trapped for hours in scorching heat. What one of the president's most powerful religious allies is now saying about resigning in the midst of a sex scandal. And meet a new generation of Republicans. How President Trump has overhauled the grand old party and the dangerous conspiracy theory that could be gaining steam in the halls of Congress. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Night two of the Republican National Convention will bring a few things we have never seen before. Among them, a Secretary of State giving his speech on foreign soil and the First Lady delivering her message from the Rose Garden. Last night, the Republicans made their pitch to voters and diversity was on full display. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, who we'll speak to shortly, told his story, saying his family went from cotton to Congress in a single lifetime. But his optimistic tone was in the minority and often drowned out by stark warnings from other speakers like Donald Trump Jr., who warned of doom and gloom if the Democrats win. Jonathan Carl leads us off with what we can expect tonight. Tonight, the normally low-key First Lady steps into the political spotlight. Speaking from the Rose Garden, she helped redesign. Her advisors say the speech will be positive and forward-looking, a stark contrast from what we heard on night one. The tone was set early on by the St. Louis couple who brandished weapons at protesters marching by their home in June. No matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats America. It was an ominous message echoed loudly by Kimberly Guilfoyle, former Fox News host and girlfriend of Donald Trump Jr. and the ex-wife of the current Democratic governor of California. Don't let them destroy your families, your lives and your future. Don't let them kill future generations because they told you and brainwashed you and fed you lies that you weren't good enough. A little later, the theme was picked up by Donald Trump Jr. It's almost like this election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. Two of the most high-profile speakers of the night were Republicans with dramatically different styles than the president, both of them people of color. Nikki Haley the former governor of South Carolina, who served under President Trump as the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, highlighted her story as the daughter of immigrants from India. In much of the Democratic Party, it's now fashionable to say that America is racist. That is a lie. America is not a racist country. And Senator Tim Scott, also from South Carolina, gave a hopeful speech about the opportunity he has found in America. Our family went from cotton to Congress in one lifetime. And that's why I believe the next American century can be better than the last. Jonathan Carl joins us now from the White House. John, the First Lady, the major headliner tonight. What do we know about what she plans to say? Well, her aides say that this is going to be a hopeful and an optimistic, forward-looking speech. They also say it'll be a rather long speech. She's not known for giving uh, long speeches. She's not really known for being out there much at all. She's been a very low-profile uh, uh, first lady, but she is stepping into that rose garden, which, of course, uh, she uh, she herself led the redesign of, uh, just newly redesigned. And that's basically what we know. And what's the response now from the White House and also? So the RNC about these concerns with regard to Mike Pompeo's speech mixing politics with official State Department business. 
Well, the RNC is saying that Pompeo taped this speech in his personal capacity, even though he was traveling in Israel. He taped it from Jerusalem. He was in Israel as the Secretary of State, but apparently they say he took a break and no State Department resources were used. Uh, in fact, they say the RNC under, uh, underwrote all of the costs of the taping of this speech. But I've got to tell you, Lindsay, uh, I don't know if that really answers the criticism. Um, uh, Secretary Pompeo himself put out a notice last month to all U.S. missions. Uh, this was um, uh, actually December 2019 that said uh, that, that State Department employees must not improperly engage the Democrat, the Department of State in the political process. And then another memo from that time from the Office of Legal Counsel over at the State Department said Senate confirmed presidential appointees may not even attend political party convention or convention related events. And here you have Mike Pompeo uh, really g giving a quite prominent speech at the convention. Uh, I, I tell you, I covered the State Department for, for a long time. I, I traveled all around the world with Secretaries of State Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell. None of the last six Secretaries of State even attended a national convention. And we're also learning that the president will be issuing a pardon tonight during the convention. What can you tell us about that? This is another one that just really breaks all, uh, uh, breaks new ground, never imagined something like this would happen. The president is going to use his official pardon power, one of the, one, one of the true uh, unquestioned powers of the, uh, of the chief executive to pardon John Pounder. Now, John Pounder is a convicted bank robber and founder of a nonprofit organization called Hope for Prisoners that helps former inmates. He is somebody uh, who has taken part in events here at the White House in the past very active in the effort uh, at criminal justice reform, uh, prison reform, and he will get a pardon right in the middle of the of the convention. Again, the kind of thing I, I, I promise you we have never seen before. Just unprecedented all around. Okay, Jonathan Carl, thanks so much. Thanks, we are joined Lindsay. now by South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, who drew praise for his speech at last night's GOP convention. We live in a world that only wants you to believe in the bad news, racially, economically, and culturally polarizing news. The truth is, our nation's arc always bends back towards fairness. We are not fully where we want to be, but I thank God Almighty we are not where we used to be. We are always striving to be better. And Senator Scott joins us now. Thanks so much for joining us, Senator. You got a lot uh, of attention and traction on that one line in particular about how you went from cotton to Congress in one lifetime in your family. We appreciate you taking the time to come on the show with us. Well, thank you very much, Lindsay. It's good to be back with you. And certainly, uh, what, what a blessing to live in a country where you can literally go from cotton, picking cotton in one time, lifetime, uh, and in the same lifetime, end up having your grandson in Congress. It says a lot about the American dream and the American creed. Quite an impressive trajectory for you. You laid out the case also for why President Trump should get a second term, and you've commended him on his efforts for black Americans when it comes to criminal justice re reform, funding for HBCUs, and a strong economy for minorities before the pandemic. But the president goes far beyond that and says that he's done more for African Americans than any president since Lincoln. At one point, he said, bar none, that he's done more for African Americans than anyone else. Do you agree with that statement? Well, he certainly has done a lot as, as president, certainly more than a president has in the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, and so I do celebrate the accomplishments that he and I have been able to work together on. And beyond what you've named, we should add on to that sickle cell anemia research. We should add on top of that work for black farmers, getting a farm number to participate in the farm programs in our nation, uh, workforce participation, an increase in the uh, home ownership percentage from when he, when he started to where we are now. So there's a lot of accomplishments under the belt uh, in this administration that really outpaces anything that I've seen in my lifetime. Uh, I'll probably leave it right there, though. But would you say, though, that now that the pandemic has exposed so many systemic issues of economic and racial inequality, that he needs to do a lot more? 
Well, I think we, as a nation, have a, a lot of work to do to help shore up our, our most vulnerable in our society. Uh, and that doesn't mean that the government needs to lead the charge. It does mean, however, that we have to stitch together the private sector response to the, to the pandemic as it relates to job creation. We're going to have to look at the gig economy. We're going to have to look at connection issues uh, like broadband in rural areas and, and, and inner city America. These are issues that we're going to have to tackle from a broadband front and from an entrepreneurial perspective. You, you think about Elon Musk and the uh, launch of 59, I think it was, satellites. There's a lot of ways for us to bring the connectivity so you can telework, have telemedicine, and a future in the gig economy. We have to focus on that future that is now closer than ever because of the pandemic. So there's much work that needs to be done, and we should partner with people to make sure that we get the resources to the right aspects or the right areas of this country and so we can have an equal distribution of opportunity uh, flowing through this country. Now, the administration does deserve credit for criminal justice reform passed in 2018. Full stop. Now, yes, ma'am. As you know, that was a bipartisan effort that easily passed in the Senate, 87 oh, to 12. Now, the president touts himself as a deal maker. So, what has he been able to do? Or has he tried to help negotiate a deal on police reform this summer in the wake of these nationwide protests? And as we see now, as I talk to you, there are uh, protests that are actively going on in Kenosha after the, uh, the shooting multiple times in the back of, of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. Yes, ma'am. I'll give you a, a few points that I think uh, crystallizes the efforts of the White House. It's really embedded in the executive order that I use along with the House bill to really create the third leg of the stool. In his executive order, uh, he passed the national database that the Democrats said would be critical for us to have the information so that bad officers are not able to hop from one agency to the other agency. I had the preservation of the records, he created the national database that the, the left wanted, a, a good decision probably on both sides, uh, and my legislation spoke to the local preservation. A second issue that we talked about uh, that he did in the executive order was he spoke to the importance of co-responders to scenes, especially scenes that include a mental instability or, or alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and or homelessness, because in some instances, what you really need is a medical expert and not just an officer. Uh, that was a part of the executive order. Uh, we think we should fund that through grants and make sure that more agencies, 18,000 throughout this country, uh, more agencies have the resources necessary to tackle that problem. Uh, and then we continued uh, down the road in conversation with my legislation on how we dealt with the federal apparatus and instructing the AG to ban chokeholds and federal agencies. So, I think those were good, a good start, frankly. I think that got us closer to the 50-yard line, and my legislation brought us to the 10. I think there's room for us to grow this conversation into a legislation that passes and becomes law. Yeah, lots more conversation and, and action, hopefully, to come on that. Last night, you discussed Opportunity so. Zones and your signature yes, initiative that passed in 2017 with President Trump's support to bring billions of dollars of private sector investments into distressed communities. But a report this summer by the Urban Institute found that much of the money is flowing to real estate developers instead of aiding businesses or job creation in black communities. And, and here's how the New York Times put it in a report last year. I just want to quote, billions of untaxed investment profits are beginning to pour into high-end apartment buildings and hotels, storage facilities that employ only a handful of workers and student housing in bustling college towns, among other projects. Many of the projects that will enjoy special tax status were underway long long before the Opportunity Zone provision was enacted. So what's your response to this criticism that these Opportunity Zones are benefiting the wealthy more than the black residents in these communities? Well, thank, thank you, Lindsay. I have been doing a lot of research on this topic, too, so I'm glad you asked. Uh, unfair unbalance is the reporting that you're getting from New York Times. The fact of the matter is, you look at the issue of impact on the black community specifically, you start with the issue of gentrification. Fewer than 4 percent of the zones showed any signs of gentrification. You look at the issue of workforce development within the zones, you saw somewhere between 6 and 8 percent increase in the wages within the zones. You look at the issue of property values. and 
frankly, 60% of the residents own their property. Property values went up about 10 or 12%, which is good news from a valuation perspective. You also can cherry pick what you want to report in the New York Times, which is really unfortunate. So around the country, I can go to Georgetown, I can go to Rock Hill, I can go uh, to Maine, uh, Texas. And what you'll find is that affordable housing has been a key in this entire opportunity zone project approach. Real estate is one part of the apparatus. The other part is job creation and stabilization. When you see the full complement, I think you'd walk away with a different opinion. And it's one of the reasons why both Donald Trump and, and now I hear uh, even Joe Biden wants to maintain the opportunity zone. So it's doing something that nothing else has done. And that's a good thing. Senator Tim Scott, we appreciate your time, especially in this busy week. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Have a great day, ma'am. And now we turn to that deadly storm, Hurricane Laura. It's intensifying and taking aim at Texas and Louisiana. States of emergency are now in place and mandatory evacuations underway. Anyone living between Houston and New Orleans needs to pay close attention to this storm, which could be the strongest one to hit the region since 2005. We, of course, have comprehensive coverage of this looming threat in the Gulf. Let's begin now with Rob Marciano, who's in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And Rob, we'll get to the forecast in just a minute, but as a meteorologist, what's your great greatest concern is Hurricane Laura gets closer to the Gulf Coast. And, and what are some of the conditions that you expect to see soon in that area? Well, it, it, they're going to be life-threatening conditions, unfortunately, uh, Lindsay. Uh, with this storm, it's it, nothing like Marco. Uh, this is going to be so much bigger, so much stronger. And the problem with big storms that get in this part of the Gulf of Mexico, the surge is huge. So I think the two big, most dangerous impacts are going to be destructive winds, because we're going to have a Cat 2 or 3 hurricane coming in far inland, and then life-threatening storm surge far inland as well. Lake Charles, where I stand, it sits about 30 miles from the coastline. We've got a drone up flying, flying around it to give you an idea of uh, the landscape here. And it, it's not just this one lake. There's a series of lakes, bayous, and canals that feed their way in, in and out of the Gulf of Mexico. It's flat land. So water in, from a storm surge is going to travel far inland. Where I stand or across the other side of the lake, they'll get to 10, 11, 12 feet of water with this surge, and potentially even north of Interstate 10. And the amount of surge that we're seeing is about 500 miles of the, uh, along the coastline. So surge is going to be a huge. You can hide from the wind, but you have to run from the surge. So now we're seeing people with evacuation orders across uh, the upper Texas coastline in through Cameron and Calcasieu Parish is here. And so that's going to be uh, the, main, the main threat. And with uh, these kind of winds coming in, Lindsay, and the conditions will go downhill beginning tomorrow afternoon with the peak of the winds after midnight to about sunup on, on Thursday. That's when trees are going to come down, infrastructure is going to fail, uh, people are going to be without power for days, uh, if not weeks, across a huge area. And this, this is a fairly populated area. So we're talking about a lot of Americans that are going to be suffering. Plenty. Nice surge, the big concern there. Rob Marciano, thanks so much. Stay safe. In preparation all day long, homes and businesses have been boarded up with families trying to move to safety. Our teams in the region saw scenes like these, lines of cars of people evacuating the storm zone. Evacuations made even trickier in the middle of a pandemic. Marcus Moore has more on the race against time in Galveston, with so many frantically making last minute preparations. Time is quickly running out tonight for thousands of families along the Gulf Coast to board up, pack up, and get out. We are seeing a very long and slow line of traffic coming away from Galveston Island. Hurricane Laura, a powerful storm plotting an uncertain course. Take a look. This is the uh, line to get onto the Bolivar Ferry. Many here remembering the chaotic evacuation in 2005 ahead of Hurricane Rita. It caused massive gridlock. Most of the storm's deaths were from the evacuation itself. Coastal areas bracing for up to a 13-foot storm surge and 115-mile-per-hour winds. We don't have the resources to go door-to-door -door and pull people out of their homes and have no intention of doing that. Once it gets past the Category 2 with the surge issues, there's no way I'm going to take that chance. Just grab our dogs and our family and go. In Galveston, more than 50 residents of this nursing home evacuated with two weeks' worth of supplies. With the pandemic, we were required to do two buses and half the size. Any movement in Laura's track could take it right over here. Houston, the city hard hit by COVID-19, forcing officials to change how they shelter families. The shelters that we are going to set up will still follow the, uh, the uh, uh, COVID uh, protocols. 
Uh, we'll take people's temperatures. People still have to be social distance. In Louisiana, where Katrina made landfall nearly 15 years ago, officials watching that track too, hoping families remember the storm's devastating blow. You don't get a chance to leave once those waves start coming ashore. So hopefully everybody will take the warning seriously. And Lindsay, uh, late tonight, the port of Galveston has been closed, and it's a key route for the uh, commercial boats and also shipping containers that come into this part of the Gulf. And uh, officials here on the island, they are hoping people heed the warnings and they evacuate by tomorrow morning at the absolute latest because the concern here is that this storm might not make its, its northerly turn soon enough, and that would leave officials here uh, on the island without enough time to evacuate and, and for this storm to potentially take aim at Galveston. Lindsay. Our thanks to Marcus. And so we now know about the very serious threat that this storm is bringing. But let's take a look at the timeline. Greg Dutra from our powerhouse Chicago station, WLS, joins us now. Greg, break it all down for us. Uh, so we have a very large storm. First, I want to get that out of the way. This is much larger, much more powerful than Marco was, covering a wide swath, now a Category 1 with winds at 80 miles per hour. And as you can see, tracking west to northwesterly, but still needs to take a pretty, uh, pretty large northerly turn to actually get inland, as Marcus was talking about about tropical storm watches. Look how far those go inland all the way to northern Louisiana, but hurricane warnings along the coast. And the biggest concern here is the storm surge by far as look at this highest surge, nine to 13 feet and then down into Trinity Bay, which is near Galveston, six to nine feet there and it extends all the way to the mouth of the Mississippi River. That's some 500 miles of coastline that is covered by storm surge from this, giving you an idea how much bigger this is than Marcus. Here is the timeline on this. Okay, it looks like landfall is going to be late, late Wednesday night, if not early Thursday morning and also look at the intensity. We're going up, up and up here. I would say intensifying steadily or even rapid intensification, which makes forecasting this even a little bit harder. If it goes through an eyewall replacement cycle right before it makes landfall, it could even potentially be a middle or high end category three storm. One thing I'm not as worried about will be the rain. I know a lot of folks are still very weary about Harvey. That's not going to happen again here as this moves north pretty quickly. Still though, six to 10 inches of rain on top of what could be more than a dozen feet of storm surge is something that you do not want to see. And Greg, right now it looks like the Texas-Louisiana border could be the bullseye, but it also looks like people in New Orleans or even Houston should not let their guard down. Yeah, right now it looks like it's almost taking a carbon copy of the Rita track, but as you said, don't let your guard down. So this is the cone of uncertainty, right? It's not just magically made up. It's based off of science. It's the 66% probability of the national hurricane forecast going back years and years. So two-thirds of the time, this is where the storm tracks. One third of the time, the storm tracks outside of this. Right now, with this time frame, the cone is about 120 miles wide. That's pretty good accuracy wise, but again, one third of the time, it could come out of that and make its way out to Houston. And the most powerful spot in the storm here, the north and eastern quadrant, is where we could see the highest wind. So if this takes a little bit more of a turn off to the west, all of a sudden, Houston and Galveston come into play for the dirty side of the storm here, the left or right front, rather, where you see the strongest winds, the highest storm surge, and the the greatest tornado risk too and that would just add on to the storm surge that's around 13 feet and you know the 10 inches of rainfall so that is not a good situation something everybody needs to watch even out near st charles and off to the east of that potential insult to injury there yes. and, and, and rob also mentioned that this storm intensifying as it gets closer we've already seen the predictions of this storm change from a cat two to now a cat three on landfall why is predicting storm strength so difficult well as you get up into major hurricane status as i said you go through eyewall replacement cycles where the eyewall breaks down and then reforms and when it does that there's a quick little peak in intensity 5 10 15 miles worth of wind and that is a lot going from 115 to 125 right when it's making landfall is something you don't want to see so there's an intensity standpoint but there's also a weather around the standpoint this is being steered by high pressure that's up over Florida if that high is a little bit stronger that could make it push a bit more off to the west and then as I said Houston and Galveston come into play. Greg Dutra from our Chicago station, WLS, we thank you so much. And now to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where protests have erupted after Jacob Blake, a black father, was shot multiple times in the back by a white police officer. This while Blake was reaching into his car, his three young sons in the back seat. New video tonight appears to show what happened just moments before the shooting. Blake is now paralyzed from the waist down, according to his family. ABC's Alex Perez reports tonight from Kenosha. Tonight, anger boiling over in Kenosha, Wisconsin, over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Protesters ignoring a curfew last night with outrage in the streets. 
storming businesses, swinging baseball bats, setting buildings on fire and igniting trucks and cars. Police responding with tear gas and pepper spray. The National Guard trying to enforce order, tensions reaching a fever pitch. Blake's mother making an emotional plea for peaceful protests. Do Jacob justice on this level and examine your hearts to all of the police officers. I'm praying for you and your families. Now, new video emerging showing a different angle just moments before Blake was riddled with bullets. He appears to be struggling on the ground with police before getting up and walking to open his car door when one of the officers opens fire, his three children inside watching. All my grandson asked repeatedly is why did the police shoot my daddy in the back? Tonight, Blake is in the hospital. His attorney says he's paralyzed from the waist down and it will take a miracle for him to walk again. They shot my son seven times. Seven times. Like he didn't matter. But my son matters. The officers now under investigation and the Kenosha police do not wear body cameras. Justice will be served. People will be held responsible for their actions, and we will know the truth. The shooting causing more frustration. Marchers taking to the streets in cities across the country. NBA star LeBron James expressing the anger of many. We are scared as black people in America. Black men, black women, black kids, we are, we are terrified. Yeah, some powerful words there from LeBron. And we, and we now bring in Alex Perez, who's in Kenosha again for us tonight, where the governor has declared a state of emergency. How do things look on the ground, and what's expected overnight, Alex? Well, Lindsay, things have been calm here throughout the day as they have been during the day the last week, but it's at night the big concern. That's where we have seen the more destructive protests, and tonight is no different than that. Authorities are preparing for any possibility. There is a curfew tonight, again, once again, beginning at 8 p.m. Uh, authorities say they are on alert. The National Guard has been called in to support local law enforcement, and so they're hoping for the best right now, but uh, everyone's still on alert here, Lindsay. And Alex, so the Justice Department, they're now assisting in the investigation into Blake's shooting? Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. The DOJ confirmed today they are investigating and working on this case. Local investigators have 30 days to present their findings to the prosecutor here. Blake's family is calling for the officers involved to be fired immediately and held accountable. Lindsay? Alex Perez, thanks so much for your reporting there. And now to the coronavirus crisis, more than 177,000 American lives lost and 30 potential vaccines and human trials around the world. But the FDA is under scrutiny tonight, facing pressure to approve a vaccine. And it comes as the head of the FDA is issuing an apology. Our Steve Osinsami has more. There were fewer than 200 people who came to this Boston hotel in February for an international biotech conference. But a new study tonight says that this one event may have led to nearly 20,000 COVID-19 infections in the Boston area alone. The race for a potential vaccine to end this pandemic is seriously on with 30 in human trials around the world. But America's leading infectious disease doctor is warning everyone about rolling any of them out too early, saying that the one thing you would not want to see with a vaccine is getting an EUA, emergency use authorization, before you have a signal of efficacy. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Anthony Fauci warns that this could also make it more difficult for any of the other efforts to find enough volunteers like these people for their clinical trials. I don't want to be sitting down not doing anything. Critics believe the FDA is being rushed as well and are pointing to the president. The agency has just given the okay for emergency use of plasma therapy to treat COVID-19 and the commissioner is being called out for overselling the potential benefits during this news conference with President Trump. The commissioner is now apologizing for exaggerating the numbers but says the agency's move is still a good one. I can assure the American people that this decision was made based upon sound science and data. There are now two new reported cases of people who've gotten reinfected with COVID-19 within months. Last night, we told you about a case out of Hong Kong. Tonight, two new cases in Europe, including a Belgian woman who first got sick in March and then tested positive again in June.
Lindsay. Our thanks to you, Stephen. When we come back, the fastest man alive has tested positive for COVID. Contact tracing is now being done to see who has been near. The major airline cutting thousands of jobs because of the fear that travel will not be rebounding anytime soon. But up next, one of the president's most powerful religious allies stepping down from his job. What he's now saying about why he's resigning from Liberty University. Welcome back, everybody. He was one of the president's most powerful evangelical supporters. But tonight, Jerry Falwell Jr. has stepped down as president of Liberty University, stepping down after an alleged sex scandal involving his wife and business partner came to light. Kira Phillips has more on the dramatic fall from grace. Jerry Falwell Jr. fought to stay at the helm of Liberty University, the nation's largest Christian college, founded by his famous father. But the board had had enough, announcing it would not be in the best interest of the university for Falwell to stay on. Overnight, he resigned, telling me, it's time to move on. I've done all that I can. Today, we will confer nearly 19,000 degrees and will make history. His fall from grace was swift and steep. A one-time Miami pool attendant, Giancarlo Granda, claiming he'd had a seven-year affair with Falwell's wife, Becky, and that Falwell watched when they were intimate. I spoke with Jerry and Becky Falwell. They admit Becky did have an affair, but they deny Jerry Falwell Jr. was involved. They tell me Granda, who became a business partner, is trying to extort them. The Falwells were among the top evangelical supporters of President Trump. I truly believe Mr. Trump is America's blue-collar billionaire. Becky Falwell seen here, speaking with the president's daughter-in-law. We are so proud of our students here at Liberty, and it's, it's just such an honor to be able to serve alongside them. And we try to teach good family values and good morals. The Falwells now telling me they're victims of a political hit job. And Kara, you spoke with Jerry Falwell on the phone shortly after his resignation. What more can you share with us about what's next? And I've been talking to them uh, both, uh, Becky and Jerry Falwell, all day today, Lindsay. And I can tell you uh, that Jerry Falwell Jr. says he's not sure what's next uh, for him, that he has done all that he can do, and he just needed to put in his resignation. Uh, apparently, too, board members have been calling them today, showing support for their family. According to the Falwells, not everybody on board with his decision to leave Liberty. Yeah, one can imagine. Okay, Kira Phillips, thanks so much for your reporting. Still lots ahead here on Prime. The FBI says QAnon could pose a domestic terror threat, but several Republican candidates for Congress support QAnon, and the president says he welcomes the followers' support. We'll take a closer look at some of the next generation of GOP candidates. The horrific family tragedy. The officer's wife trapped inside the back of his police SUV for several hours during soaring temperatures above 90 degrees. How could this happen? And during the first night of the RNC, we heard boasts about the economy pre-pandemic. We'll take a look by the numbers. How strong was the economy? But first, our tweet of the day, a tribute from a wife to her beloved husband.
Welcome back, everybody. As we head now into night two of the Republican National Convention, we can expect high praise for President Trump's pre-pandemic economic record. While there's much to debate about the strength and merit of that track record, tonight we look broadly by the numbers at just a few key data points. Until the pandemic hit in February, the U.S. economy had expanded for 128 straight months, making it the country's largest economic expansion on record. While the Trump campaign touts this impressive growth it is worth noting the expansion actually began in June of 2009 on President Obama's watch. Annual GDP growth reached 3.1 percent in early 2019. That was below what Trump promised during the 2016 campaign, but nevertheless still strong. Then, of course, the coronavirus struck and the U.S. economy contracted by 32.9 percent from the previous year, the sharpest decline in modern American history. And let's also take a look at unemployment, which fell to 3.5 percent last year the lowest in half a century. By comparison, unemployment dropped to a low of 4.7 percent during the Obama years, still a dramatic fall from where it began at 10 percent. Today, after 12.9 million Americans have lost jobs during the pandemic, we're currently at 10.2 percent unemployment. Still a lot to get to here on Prime, our closer look at the complicated relationship between the president and law enforcement. And speaking of the president, he was once a political outsider, but he now has a firm grip of control in the GOP and inspiring a new generation of candidates to join him in disrupting Washington, D.C. We'll hear from some of them. But first, here are some of the trending stories on ABCnews.com. Mandatory evacuations today along the Gulf Coast as Hurricane Laura makes its way to the shores of Texas and Louisiana. All eyes from this point uh, and forward will be on Laura. Laura expected to gather strength and become a major hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico Wednesday. In Louisiana, hundreds of oil and gas companies rushing to evacuate workers off their rigs. Walls of sandbags growing ahead of the storm, people lining up to get out of Laura's path. And in Texas, millions are bracing for what Laura might bring. When we heard category two, three, we're like, mm, yeah, I think it's time for us to go. I noticed a lot of damage. It doesn't reflect my son or my family. Demonstrations are going strong for a third day in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The anger sparked by the shooting of 29-year-old Jacob Blake. New video obtained by ABC News shows the moments right before he was shot Sunday evening around 5. Kenosha police say they were responding to a domestic incident when officers encountered Blake. Seven times. 
seventh time. Like he didn't matter. But my son matters. Blake, who is 29 years old, is in the hospital right now undergoing surgery. His lawyers say it is unlikely he will ever walk again. A police officer's wife died when she got trapped somehow inside her husband's patrol cruiser as the temperatures kept rising. The Miami Herald reports Clara Paulino got into the back seat of the SUV last Friday in Miami Shores. While she was looking for something, the doors closed and automatically locked, trapping her inside. She was stuck for four hours without her cell phone or any way of contacting for anyone for help. The heat inside got to 92 degrees that day. And when the family got to her, she was unresponsive. I mean, my friend, neighbor is gone. And I'm sure it was horrifying for her and horrifying for her family. The Miami Herald says the woman's husband covers the midnight shift. When he got home, he fell asleep but may have left his unit unlocked. Miami-Dade PD is now investigating the case. The coronavirus outbreak continues to take a toll on air travel, with the U.S. infection rate still high. American Airlines signaling without new government aid, major cuts will be necessary. United and Delta Airlines have said they also plan to lay off tens of thousands of workers on October 1st if government aid is not extended. Today, American Airlines saying it plans to lay off or furlough up to 19,000 employees. That combined with voluntary leaves will reduce American Airlines staff by 40,000 people just to be safe quarantined myself the fastest man alive usain bolt has tested positive for the coronavirus days after his surprise mask-free birthday party bolt posted this message hours before his test results um i have no symptoms so I'm going to quarantine myself um, and wait the eight-time Olympic gold medalist says he took the test the day after his 34th birthday. Jamaica's health minister says contact tracing is now underway. He has been formally notified, uh, I'm told by the authorities. Jamaica has over 1,600 confirmed cases of the virus and 16 deaths. And we reported earlier tonight on the unrest in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after the recent shooting of Jacob Blake by a police officer. We now take a broader look at this summer of protests. And President Trump's repeated claims that he is the so-called law and order president and his opponent is not. Our Alex Perez reports for us again. An attack on law enforcement is an attack on all Americans. Trump's heavy-handed rhetoric fueled his campaign back in 2016. I am the law and order candidate. And four years later. I am your president of law and order. But after the death of George Floyd at the hands of a white police officer in May, cries across the country to reform police practices. <laughs> demanding social justice and a stop to police brutality. Protests in the streets of Portland, Oregon, where police and protesters have clashed, videos like these going viral on social media, deepening divisions between police and the communities they serve. President Trump mobilizing federal resources, even though some local officials said they didn't want help from the feds and feared it would further incite violence. I am dispatching thousands and thousands of heavily armed soldiers, military personnel, and law enforcement officers to stop the rioting, looting, vandalism, assaults, and the wanton destruction of property. But as months of civil unrest fueled by cases of alleged police brutality divided the country, Trump pushed a message of unity between his administration and police. The radical politicians are waging war on innocent Americans. That's what you're doing when you play with the police. My administration is pro-safety, pro-police, and anti-crime. Last month, launching what he called Operation Legend, a federal program aimed at helping local law enforcement fight surges in violence in nine cities. 
In this summer of protests against police brutality, many officers themselves have been injured or killed in the line of duty. Like retired police captain David Dorn, who was shot and killed by suspected looters while protecting a friend's store. He really tried to make a difference. I would just want him to be remembered as that person in the community that tried to go above and beyond. But the vast majority of Black Lives Matter protests have been peaceful. As the nation mourned after the killing of George Floyd, Trump called Floyd's death a, quote, disgrace and said he was an ally of those who protest lawfully. I am your president of law and order and an ally of all peaceful protesters. Peaceful protesters in Washington, D.C. say they were subjected to an unprovoked escalation and excessive use of force as they faced off against federal police in riot gear who fired gas canisters and used grenades containing rubber pellets to clear the way for the president's June photo op in front of St. John's Church. Trump now drawing a sharp distinction between his law and order record and the record of his opponent. It's a left-wing war on cops. If sleepy Joe Biden were to become president, he would immediately pass legislation to gut every single police department in America. You know that. My agenda is anti-crime and pro-cop all the way, and that's what it's got to be. Slamming calls to defund the police, a move Joe Biden also opposes. There won't be defunding, there won't be a dismantling of our police, and uh, there's not going to be any disbanding of our police. We're going to work and we're going to talk about ideas how we can do it better and how we can do it, if possible, in a much more gentle fashion. There is one arm of law enforcement that President Trump has been all too willing to attack, and that is his own FBI. This spring, when he blasted the investigators who probed his former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, during its investigation of Russia's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential campaign. These were dirty, filthy cops at the top of the FBI, and uh, you know the names better than I do, and they were dishonest people. Alex Perez, ABC News, Kenosha. Our thanks to Alex Perez for that. Republicans this week, they're celebrating the rising stars, the next generation of young candidates, all in the shadow of the man in charge of the party. Donald Trump has shaken up the GOP, and some say redefined what it means to be a Republican in this country in 2020, and in characteristic fashion, keeping the door open to the political fringe. Here's Devin Dwyer. This week, the grand old party is showcasing its top young talent. This is personal for me. I am the proud daughter of Indian immigrants. A parade of Republicans embracing Donald Trump and Trumpism as the party's future. We must win this election if we cherish our country as much as we should. President Trump, once a political outsider and former Democrat, much. is now firmly in control of the GOP, and inspiring a new generation of candidates to join him in disrupting D.C. They see Donald Trump as, as walking in there and, you know, breaking some China and shaking things up in a way that will really serve the future of this country. One of those newcomers, 24-year-old Madison Cawthorn of North Carolina, who'd become the youngest member of Congress from either party. He defeated the Trump-backed candidate in the primary, but is already winning praise from the president. He defined our victory as beautiful, and I'll tell you, he was just, uh, he, he was as gracious as he, as he could have been. He's invited me up to the White House, so I'm really looking forward to get to go see him in the Oval. Other young Republican candidates touting their Trump ties, too, like 32-year-old Jake LaTurner of Eastern Kansas, one of the country's most competitive House races. What we need are grown-ups to go to Washington, D.C., stand firm on principle, uh, and at the end of the day, get something done. Do you think compromise is a good thing? Do you think it's a dirty word? I have strong core convictions that I'm willing to stand up and defend. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, you get to take your ball and go home when someone disagrees with you on something. You want to do everything you can to move the ball down the field. LaTurner is a father of four, raised in rural Kansas by a single dad who worked at the local Sonic drive-in restaurant to pay for college and become a teacher. His family, he says, reflects Republican ideals. I think the Republicans need to do a better job of selling our message. It's very attractive. Individual freedom, personal responsibility. Do you think right now that loyalty to Trump is sort of a prerequisite to be a Republican? Or how do you thread that needle? This is a party that trusts individuals. 
uh, to believe what they believe. Um, this isn't the party of cancel culture uh, like the Democrats are. You're able to have unique opinions in the Republican Party. But those unique opinions don't always sit well with President Trump, who's branded Republicans that disagree with him as Republicans in name only, or rhinos. And a couple of rhinos, frankly, they're rhinos. Trump attacking former Republican presidential nominee Senator Mitt Romney, former GOP House Speaker Paul Ryan, and popular Maryland Republican Governor Larry Hogan, among others. The president often talks about how he, you know, gets a lot of ratings. But at the end of the day, people want problems solved, not ratings or personal, you know, popularity. And that's why some of our Republican governors are the most popular people, whether or not they are loyal to this president. For many Republicans sharing the ballot with Trump this fall, striking a balance is key. I've always been an independent thinker. And even when I have spoken out, I'm often speaking out against members of my own party. Nancy Mace, a former Trump campaign staffer, is one of a record 98 Republican women running for the U.S. House. The single mother of two and small business owner is the first woman to graduate from the Citadel. Now she hopes to make history as the first Republican woman to represent South Carolina in Congress. There are a lot of moms out there just like me, a lot of single moms too, that we've got to balance our checkbooks, we've got to educate our kids, and these are very trying times. And if they're anything like me, they just raised their hand and said, I'm sick and tired of this, and I want to make a difference, and I want to make a change. To win back the House, Republicans need to win seats like hers. Swing districts held by Democrats where feelings about the president are mixed. With 9 in 10 Republican voters still strongly supportive of the president, loyalty to him and how he defines Republicanism cannot be ignored. The Republican Party continues to push forward different ideas, continues to foster debate, and young Republicans are rallying around Donald Trump this year. Meanwhile, Trump is showing openness to the political fringe, from birtherism and white supremacy to the online conspiracy theory QAnon. The baseless theory believes a satanic cult of pedophiles and cannibals has infiltrated the government. In their mind, the president was elected to get rid of this cabal that's controlling the rest of us. And that's why apparently they're so supportive of him. The FBI says QAnon could pose a domestic terrorist threat, and some of its followers have been charged with murder, planned kidnapping, and domestic terror. But the president and some Republican candidates have welcomed their support. Well, I don't know much about the movement other than I understand they like me very much. Uh, which I appreciate. At least three GOP congressional candidates have openly embraced QAnon. Joe Ray Perkins of Oregon, Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia, and Lauren Boebert of Colorado. If elected, they'd be the first to give it a foothold in U.S. government. You can't corroborate any of it, but you have to listen to it only because there are millions of people that do listen to it. They have issues with the government. Some of those folks may take it into their own hands. Q is not one person, okay? Q is a bunch of people. They're on the inside. They're the good guys. Do you think the party has to more forcefully disavow conspiracy theorists like QAnon? Oh, definitely. And I don't think they're going to be the future of any party that wants to be in the majority. And that's why I will look forward to uh, ridding the party of, of those problem children. Nancy Mace and Jake LaTurner say the party's focus must be on solutions for the future. I am not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a realist and I'm pragmatic. I think young people want the truth. I think they want substance. And for now, many can't get enough of Donald Trump in full control of his party and influencing Republican leaders of the future no matter what happens in November. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Our thanks to Devin for that. And when we come back, we'll speak with our political director about what to watch out for as we get ready for night two of the RNC. Tonight. Are you legal or not? That's a simple question. It's the hot topic torn from...
nice time with their pod. And now back to the race for 2020. Rick Klein joins us now to look ahead at night two of the RNC. And Rick, Republicans promised an optimistic tone last night. In reality, that's not what we saw. Just want to quote, President Trump was talking about a Democrats win. Your American dream will be dead if that happens. Uh, Representative Matt Gates from Florida said they'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home and invite MS-13 to live next door. And the police aren't coming when you call. Do we expect that tonight will be perhaps the the uplifting and, and hopeful night. And who specifically will you be watching for this evening? I think the tone is basically set, Lindsay, and I think you're going to continue to hear uh, kind of a dual message. One is, yes, optimism in President Trump's leadership and kind of a, a rewriting of his history around COVID-19 and race relations. And more than that, though, it is an attack on Joe Biden and the Democrats. And to that end, having several people named Trump speaking tonight, including the president himself, we're expecting him to show up again, two of his, of his adult children. I'm interested in Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in an unusual break of protocol. He's speaking from Jerusalem, where he has been on a ta taxpayer fund trip. In addition to that, the night is likely to belong to the First Lady Melania Trump speaking from the Rose Garden with her, with her husband in attendance. Again, not something that we have ever seen before in a political convention and, of course, very Trumpian. And, Rick, the Republicans blasted the Democrats last week for not having a live convention. But last night, much of the RNC was actually pre-taped as well. Is this just the new reality of what a COVID convention looks like? Yeah, in fact, Lindsay, there's less live elements than there were with the Democrats. And I think two things. One is, yes, these realities have, have changed everything, and, and this forced the forced both, both parties to change on the fly. The other thing is the Democrats had a lot, time, a lot more time to prepare for a virtual convention. They had about four months of preparations. The, the Republicans had about four weeks because President Trump had insisted up until about a month ago that there would be a major in-person component uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. Now there's no Jacksonville, but right here in Washington, we have seen uh, most of the events taking place. Uh, it doesn't really look traditional, but it will be interesting tonight for the first time in either convention. We're going to see something of a live audience for Melania Trump's speech at the White House. And lastly, you know, during the DNC, of course, we saw President Trump with campaign events just about every day of their convention. But so far, Biden and Harris are, are keeping a rather low profile during the Republican convention. Do you expect it to stay that way? I actually do. It's more in keeping what's traditionally happened in conventions where the other candidate goes on vacation or just uh, stays quiet. Uh, today, Joe Biden went for a bike ride at his vacation place in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Kamala Harris was around her home here in Washington, D.C just taking some meetings with staffers, most of them virtual meetings, we're told. Uh, but we, we feel like, from the reporting we've heard, that the Democrats feel like th this is a week that is going to be dominated by President Trump. They're bracketing the messaging in other ways, including by rolling out Republican supporters for the Biden-Harris ticket. Uh, but we don't see an effort by Biden and Harris to go out there front and center in the news cycle like Donald Trump did last week. Rick Klein, thanks so much for your insight, as always. Thanks, Lindsay. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. Melania Trump, of course, is expected to speak tonight from the Rose Garden on night two of the Republican National Convention. But what's special about this image is that it's different. She just completed a redesign of the iconic setting. It's the first time that's happened since 1962 under President Kennedy. We'll leave it up to you whether you like the update or not. And that is our show for tonight. I'm about to switch sets and be joined by our Tom Yamas and our Powerhouse Roundtable. Stay tuned, of course, to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Good night.
This is an ABC News special. President Trump's most loyal supporters take center stage. Tiffany Trump, Eric Trump, and live from the Rose Garden, the First Lady. Tonight, the grand old party is a family affair. Live from New York City and across the country, here now, Lindsey Davis, Tom Yamas, and the ABC News powerhouse political team. And good evening. Welcome to ABC News Live. We are just 30 minutes away from the second night of the Republican National Convention. Tonight's theme, the land of promise. Republicans will make the pitch that the president will bring the COVID-battered economy back. We'll also hear more from Trump's family tonight, his children, Tiffany and Eric. But, Lindsay, as you know, the big headliner tonight, First Lady, we see her right there, Melania Trump, speaking, weather permitting, from the Rose Garden. She recently remodeled. And Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is also speaking tonight from Israel. We'll dig into more on that a bit with Martha Raddatz later in this broadcast. All of this comes as Hurricane Laura takes aim at the Gulf Coast. More than half a million people ordered to evacuate ahead of landfall and in Wisconsin where they are bracing for another night of protests after Jacob Blake, a black man, was shot in the back by a white police officer. Lindsay, so many breaking news happening on this week. All at once. Our powerhouse political team is once again back with us in New York, Washington, D.C., and across the country. Well, let's start off with Mary Bruce, who is at the White House tonight. And Mary, first question. The convention, the first night of the convention was filled with mixed messaging, promises of optimism, but at times there was a MAGA takeover and a lot of talk of dark days if Democrats win. Yet last night we did see a, a bit of a tale of two stories from the Republican Party, two stories uh, of the Trump campaign. We did hear a lot of dire warnings and ominous tales of what could come if Donald Trump is not reelected. You saw and heard uh, really an apocalyptic picture painted of what will happen to this country if Joe Biden is elected. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. There were also several speakers, uh, specifically Nikki Haley, President Trump's former U.N. ambassador, Republican Senator Tim Scott, who gave what felt like more traditional convention speeches, focusing more uh, on the president's accomplishments and arguing that the best days are still ahead. The president, though, of course, promised that this was going to be positive programming. So the question is, which message are we going to be seeing tonight? The first lady, of course, is the marquee speaker of this evening, and her team is saying that this is going to be a positive, forward-looking speech. All right, Mary, let's talk about more of that, because we know that speech is going to be at the Rose Garden. What, what is the weather like right now where you are in the White House? And explain to our viewers, because usually, I, I don't think this has ever happened, where the, the president and the first lady have addressed the convention from the White House. Critics are saying this is just wrong. Tom, we have never seen anything like this. No first family has ever used the White House as a backdrop for a political convention. Of course, we are in unprecedented times. The First Lady's team is quick to point out today that this is their home, uh, that, of course, there is a lot involved these days to try and travel and get outside of the White House compound. But still, it is incredibly unusual to be using the People's House for a political event like this. And while it is not illegal, uh, critics are quick to point out that they feel this blurs moral lines. Uh, you mentioned the weather. It has been pouring here on and off. You may see a little bit of thunder and lightning here over my shoulder. They are waiting uh, to make that weather call. But look, the First Lady has spent a lot of time uh, revamping the, 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 the Rose Garden. This is something that she's been working on for more than a year. This is an opportunity not only for her to make her pitch about why she feels her, her husband should earn another four years at the White House, but also a chance to show off the new Rose Garden, too. And speaking of blurring lines, we want to now turn to our global chief affairs correspondent Martha Raddatz. We're, we're going to hear from Secretary of State Pompeo tonight from Israel. He taped it while on the ground there yesterday. That backdrop, of course, stirring up some controversy. This is a taxpayer-funded trip abroad, and he's mixing partisan politics into his role as America's top diplomat. Would you say that the lines are blurring tonight on that issue as well? Uh, not only blurring, there are really a lot of even legal questions about this. Mike Pompeo is on a diplomatic trip. The RNC said that they paid for nothing. They didn't pay for the television crew. They didn't pay for the space. They didn't have any staff involved in the speech, any Pompeo staff involved in the speech. But the alarming thing about all of this is that in December, there was a memo from Pompeo's legal advisor that told all political appointees they were prohibited prohibited from engaging in political activity in concert with a partisan candidate, political party, or partisan political group, and specifically said that Senate-confirmed presidential appointees, like Pompeo, may not even attend a political party convention or convention-related event. And that's what 
the last six secretaries of state have done. They haven't even gone to the convention. They've taken great care to separate those two things. Earlier in the week, uh, the State Department said this was a, a personal, a personal appeal for Mike Pompeo. But it's a little hard to separate Secretary of State Mike Pompeo from personal Mike Pompeo, especially when he's giving a speech like this. And Martha, the Trump administration has seen some wins on the global stage, including the recent deal between the UAE and Israel. The Secretary of State swinging through several countries, trying to get them to sign on to recognizing relations with Israel now. But this administration has also alienated many international allies with the America First policy and the tough talk. How is Secretary Pompeo going to frame this tonight? Well, I think he's going to just say this America first policy has kept us safe and secure, and that Donald Trump has done everything to secure our freedom and safety. Uh, but I turn you to Iran and North Korea. I mean, President Trump has, there's no question about it, he's made some very bold moves, and no one, no one has been successful with North Korea, but the president has not either, despite his promises, despite uh, wanting a nuclear deal with North Korea. He just hasn't gotten one. And, of course, he ripped up the deal or got out of the deal uh, with Iran, and, and they have made gains as well. They have begun violating the terms of the nuclear agreement that the United States got out of, Lindsay. All right, I'll take it from there, Martha. Thank you. We want to bring in our senior national correspondent now, Terry Moran. Terry, we're learning that the president has issued a pardon that will be part of the convention tonight. The White House releasing video of it just before the convention starts tonight. Give us the details, and, and what do you make of this move on the big stage just before things get going tonight? You know, Tom, and it's an extraordinary scene. It's going to be an extraordinary and powerfully moving moment in tonight's convention, and one that also brings a little controversy. Uh, the president will, on camera, live without the knowledge of John Ponder, is the person's name. He was convicted of bank robbery in 2004, served his time, came out, and he founded a nonprofit organization called Hope for Prisoners. This is a reintegration nonprofit, trying to help people who served their time after being committed of crimes to reintegrate into society with their families and jobs. It's an essential cause in our excessively carceral society. And uh, he, he is surprised tonight on camera, as we will see when President Trump pardons him. And this is an extraordinary thing. The pardon power is one of the only places in the Constitution where there's no checks and no balances. And that's one of the reasons why Donald Trump loves it. Right? He's pardoned a lot of people. Pardoned Roger, Roger Stone. He's pardoned people for drug offenses that he believes were accepted. Excessively sentenced. It's the kind of thing that as a businessman, he just says it and it gets done. But to use it like this, that pardon power actually doesn't belong to him. It belongs to the people of the United States who vested it in the office of the presidency, which he temporarily occupies. And for him to use it for his personal political gain, well, that is once again one of those norm busting, tradition busting uh, yeah, things that he just does. And we're going to see him do it. But it's a powerful moment for a man who has accomplished a great deal. And Terry, I think, though, on that point, there is a theme here on the programming of this convention. We have two candidates that are very different in Joe Biden and President Donald Trump, but these conventions are also very different. And we keep talking about the unprecedented nature of a lot of these events. Last night I was watching, and, and it was curious because there was a mixed message. There were at times when you, you, know, you sort of thought you were watching a Republican National Convention. There were other times where it felt very much the Donald Trump MAGA convention. I, I'd like to know your take about this. Do you think this, this sort of, with these virtual conventions, this, I don't know if it's, if it's rebellious, but this different kind of programming is going to work with viewers. Yeah, that, that obviously is the question. I'll tell you, it'll, it'll work with that part of the country that buys into the vision of Trumpism. I've been struck by the stark difference between last week and this week. We always do. We're a divided country in many ways. But what we're divided on now is something more than policy or, or the program of the government. What should we do? It's who we are. That basic sense of who we are as Americans, two different ideas of America, of American greatness. The Republican Party, looking backward in some ways, make America great again to a time when America was more rooted in traditional faith, had an economy that was more rooted in the local, uh, in the local economy. Uh, and now the, the Democrats coming with a very different vision of America. That conflict is intense, and we are feeling it in the anger sometimes that we hear in this convention. Uh, 
and elsewhere. Tom. All right, Terry Moran, stand by. We will check in with you later in the broadcast. We, as we mentioned earlier, the headliner tonight will be First Lady Melania Trump, who will speak from the newly renovated Rose Garden, weather permitting. Joining us now is her chief of staff, Stephanie Grisham. Stephanie, thanks for your time. You know, the first question, is the weather going to be okay? Will we see the First Lady from the Rose Garden? But earlier today, you also said the speech would be uplifting. It would be positive. What can we expect tonight from the First Lady, and, and how is she prepared? Well, on the weather, we hope so. Uh, right now, we're just monitoring it very closely. We, we have a few hours to go, so that's just going to be up to Mother Nature, I sure. But we do have a backup in mind inside if it happens. Um, it is going to be positive, and it is going to be uplifting because that is who the First Lady is. She doesn't want to waste her time uh, dividing the country or speaking negatively, which is something that we all saw quite a bit last week. She's been preparing for the last two or three weeks. Uh, every word of that speech is very much her. We've been doing speech prep and going over it so it's going to be a great speech very positive she's going to be very forward-looking in terms of her husband and the things he will do for this country but also her and the things she hopes to do as first lady she also reflects a little bit on some of her favorite times as first lady and then something that I think will speak to citizens everywhere is just her personal journey you know she really is the American dream embodied and you know as you know she came to this country an immigrant and she worked very very hard to become a citizen so that's something she's going to speak to a little more than she ever has before. And Stephanie Lindsay Davis here, right? So you said that she's going to talk about immigration. Will the speech tonight also defend the president's accomplishments in the last four years and, and his handling of the pandemic? I don't know if defend is the right word. She's definitely going to tout his accomplishments. Uh, she's going to talk about the accomplishments that she's very, very proud of. She is going to talk about the pandemic. She's going to talk about it as her role as First Lady, as, as you both know, and as I'm sure your viewers know. She has been very vocal about following CDC guidelines and wearing a mask and putting videos out and social media out. So she will touch on, on a lot of that. She thanks frontline workers. She thanks healthcare workers. And she really talks about teachers and parents and how they've had to really step up in these uncertain times. Times. At the 2016 RNC convention, the First Lady delivered a speech where she was accused of lifting portions from Michelle Obama's 2008 convention address. How involved was the First Lady in writing this speech, and are you confident you avoided any mistakes like that again? absolutely confident. She has been involved from the very beginning. She has used her very small team. I have been with her every single day. Um, this is a first lady who, as we have seen over the last three and a half years, and has, as she's evolved over in this role, she's very detail-oriented. She knows exactly what she wanted to say. I think that back in 2016, it was a little bit different. She's now the first lady. She knows what she wants to say. She has a very clear message that she wants to get out. And I just want to reiterate again, we are very, very confident because these are her words. Stephanie, you know, when I sat down with the first lady in Kenya, she told me, quote, I'm the most bullied person in the world. She's just redesigned, remodeled the Rose Garden, which she received a lot of criticism for. We are in a pandemic, but even before that, she was a very private first lady. We haven't seen her out there as much over the last four years as other first ladies. So I have to ask, you know, I wonder, have the Melania haters won? And, and what, as this first term ends, what do you think her legacy will be as first lady? Well, I don't think hate ever wins, no matter who it's going towards. So uh, the answer to that is a resounding no. We're used to the people who come after her. I think that, again, when we were in Kenya with you, she was just talking about how negative social media can be, and she feels at times she can be quite bullied. And you're right, the Rose Garden is just one example. I think her legacy is going to be that she was a very quiet and dignified first lady. She's a very independent woman who put her son first no matter what. She stayed focused on exactly who she wanted to help, which is children. She's been taking up projects within the White House that actually a lot of the public doesn't know about, and that's because she doesn't seek out attention. I think she's going to be celebrated for years to come for the way she has been dignified and not needed the limelight. And turning now to the book that's set to come out by former Melania Trump friend Stephanie Winston Wolkoff. Uh, there are reports uh, that Wolkoff actually has tapes of the First Lady um, making disparaging remarks about the president and his adult children. Any reaction to this book? And also, does Mrs. Trump have any issues with the president's adult children? 
She does not. Uh, she's talked about the family very often. They're a close-knit family, and like any family, I'm sure they have some kind of uh, disagreements at times, but no, she, she doesn't disparage them. That's just silly. They're a close-knit family. Uh, the book, I no, I have nothing to say about it. I don't know much about it. All I would say is that it sounds like yet another person who has taken advantage of this Trump family. I don't know if the recordings are real. I don't know what is in the book. We're really focused on what we're doing um, in her role as First Lady and what she wants to do for the next four years. Stephanie, we thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your time, especially thank during you guys. this busy week. Thank By you. Thursday night, we will hear from each of the president's adult children, Donald Jr., Tiffany, Eric, Ivanka, plus, of course, as you just heard, the First Lady. Let's bring in Matt Dow. Now, traditionally, this is the moment that we, we see the First Ladies roll up their sleeves and hit the campaign trail, but the First Lady, she's not particularly known for stumping. Now, with COVID changing the landscape of this campaign, how much do you think that we're going to see Melania out front advocating on her husband's behalf. Well, my guess is more than we saw her for sure in 2016 and probably more than we've seen her the last three years. They know, the GOP knows, and the Trump campaign knows, they have a huge problem with women. Women left them in droves in 2018 in the midterms. You look at every poll, they have, they're problematic amongst, the, amongst women in this poll, so, and this time. So I would guess you're gonna see quite a bit of her. How much it helps, I question. It's very difficult. I've looked at this. We were involved, obviously, as you know, with your, I was involved with George W. Bush, with Laura Bush who is very popular. They have very limited impact on moving actual voters. They really don't have much effect on, on, the, on the campaigns in this because presidential races are so high profile and there's so much determined by the person running for the office. But I, we will see her more. My guess is it'll have little to no impact on the race, but we'll see her more. I want to bring in Mary Jordan now. She's author of the book, The Art of Her Deal. It was a book about Melania Trump. It came out, it got a lot of buzz. So Mary, my first question to you, were you surprised that her one time very close friend, Stephanie Walkoff, apparently recorded her? Well, I think it's more surprising uh, that Melania has so few friends. And it is interesting that this one friend who was close to her uh, really felt cut off. So uh, we'll wait and see what the book is. But I think that, I think tonight is really important for Melania. Uh, this is the first time in four years that she's had a big speech. I mean, people don't know even if she likes the president. So it's a win for her if she can come out and tell people things like, what makes her laugh? What's she doing when he's tweeting? Um, you know, I, I feel like in researching the book, I would hear things like how quick and savvy and what, you know, she's got this kind of uh, inner kind of energy. Someone said to her uh, when, a few years ago, was it several years ago, hey, would you really have married that guy if he weren't rich? And instantly she said, would he have married me if I weren't beautiful? And I think the flash is just gone. And it's confounding that we know so little about her. So it's a win tonight if she comes out. It's a win personally for her, because she tells people, I'm independent. But then she, tells, she speaks in generalities. Um, and it's a win for the campaign um, if she softens his image, because he does have a big women problem. The campaign is saying privately that we need her. We need her to kind of soften his image. She's going to come out and defend him and say he's good for women tonight. And, and, you know, then the debates will begin. Mary, you reported in your book that from the people you spoke to, the president never criticizes his wife, uh, you know, when, he, when he's speaking to his aides or to others. But we've seen over the years recently, in a couple of occasions, the first lady has broken with her husband. And most recently, as the Washington Post points out, she was the first to, to wear a mask publicly when she, she put out a social media post when her husband was not pushing the mask at all. What do you think that does to President Trump? Because loyalty is so important to him. Well, um, she has been the most loyal to him. And I think when Stephanie Grisham was talking, he really values that she doesn't need the microphone. They're so opposite, right? She never speaks. He's always talking. Uh, he's impulsive. She's the opposite. She's the chess player, the calm one. Um, and absolute trust there. But it's important to her, um, you know, it's very important. I'm sure you're going to see this tonight, that she says, you know, I'm independent, I think myself. So she has to thread the line. She clearly doesn't like some of the things he says, definitely doesn't like some of the things he tweets or does. So I think you're gonna see a little bit of a difference, but in the end, 
she always backs him up. And he does trust her uh, more than anybody else, and because he knows that she's not going to go get the microphone and, and kind of blab. She has a lot of secrets. She knows more than just about anybody. And she's the woman who's been with him, even he's been married two times before, but she's been with him longer than anybody else. And let's now bring in our leading White House editorial producer, John Santucci. John, one of the president's closest advisors is his daughter, Ivanka. She'll be reprising her role from 2016 and introducing her father on Thursday. How important is it for the president to have Ivanka close to him in the West Wing? Oh, I think it's invaluable. And I think, frankly, you see what happened earlier this week. Kellyanne Conway, the Trump uh, first campaign manager, uh, to be really the most important woman in this White House, next to Ivanka Trump and Melania Trump, uh, she's leaving. So the fact that there is one less person now uh, loyal to the president, it matters more than ever uh, to have family close by his side. And I think something Mary said, and Matt also touched on, is that he needs women right now. Women close to him that will bump him up a little bit. They definitely have a problem with women right now around the country. But what Ivanka can do, and Ivanka has done actually quite well as she has learned her role, um, is bring a different demographic in. You know, she has been very keen on working women. There is a project she's launched all around the country and around the globe right now uh, to actually bring women entrepreneurs to the table. You'll remember also something that we're going to see tonight firsthand. With with that presidential pardon. It was Ivanka and her husband, Jared Kushner, that led criminal justice reform. So Ivanka is not in the spotlight as she once was in the early days of this White House, but the little nooks that she has actually owned have been quite successful for this president. And I think you're going to see more of her on the campaign trail in the coming weeks. And let's switch gears here for a moment. We've been talking about the family. Uh, let's widen out to the RNC convention at large and bring in Yvette Simpson, CEO for Democracy for America, progressive group. So tonight we're going to hear from Daniel Cameron. He is the attorney general in Kentucky, of course, also overseeing uh, the Breonna Taylor case. We know that there have been no arrests despite uh, national outcries and protests in, in Louisville. Is that potentially problematic for the RNC? And I don't, do you think that we could see some backlash? from somebody who the black community in particular is not very happy with. Well, I think that's the pattern with the African Americans that have been a part of this convention so far. You know, the folks we saw yesterday, they aren't necessarily the folks who black people are rallying behind, but they certainly are the people who the RNC wants to put forward because there, it's not about attracting black people. It's about showing white people that Trump isn't so racist and that there are some black people who support them. He is definitely not the standard bearer because people in across the country and in Kentucky are not with this guy because he is not arrested the individuals who uh, murdered Breonna Taylor. And so it will be interesting to see if the RNC brings that up, because we've not heard much about criminal justice reform in the, in the, uh, to the extent of police brutality during this conference, and I don't expect that we will. Yvette, thank you. I, I want to actually go back to the First Lady and Sarah Fagan right now, Republican strategist. Sarah, you know, I wonder, does, does the Republican Party want more from the First Lady, or, or has she done enough? And I ask this because it's interesting. When, when we did the interview with, with Melania Trump at the time, the First Lady, the reaction I got from, from Republicans were they loved her, and I would watch them watch her answers, and they would light up. They thought she was perfect. Yeah. With Democrats, there was a lot of eye-rolling. They couldn't stand anything she said. I don't know if that's if that's the first lady or it's because of who she's married to, but Republican, it seems, re Republicans really love her, and I wonder if she's doing enough for the party and, and if they want to see more of her. Well, it's not unusual for first ladies to really shun politics. Most of them don't like it. I think Melania is, is similar to uh, previous first ladies, maybe with the exception of Hillary Clinton. Um, I would say her most important role tonight is to uh, put some softer edges around him, talk about some private moments. I think last night we saw this with several speakers. Herschel Walker, uh, Congressman Jim Jordan talked about personal times that they encountered the president without cameras, um, being a human, being kind, being thoughtful about their families. She can do that better than anyone else. I agree with Matt Dowd. It's probably not going to move a lot of voters. But it's definitely a different element to this man. And yes, Republicans want to see more of it. And I think um, all voters uh, prefer her sometimes to, to the president. And that's oft often the case with first ladies, too. 
All right, Sarah, thank you for that. When we come back, the growing number of Republican defectors pulling out all the stops to prevent a Trump second term. But will it make a difference? Our in-depth look at the Lincoln Project. Stay with us. as I know that you do. Stand and speak and vote your conscience. Vote for candidates up and down the ticket who you trust to defend our freedom and to be faithful to the Constitution. I was just steps from Senator Ted Cruz when he said that four years ago. I, the way he described it was it was like this professional wrestler, Stone Cold Steve Austin. That was the Stone Cold Stunner right there. When Ted Cruz taking a stand against the president in 2016 before having a change of heart just weeks later and eventually becoming a staunch defender of the Trump administration. That moment, a reminder, though, from the beginning, the Trump presidency has been divisive, even inside his own party. Just hours before the Republican convention began, 27 former Republican members of Congress abandoned the GOP and instead endorse Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And this has been going on for a while. For more than a year, he's been dogged by the Lincoln Project and two other groups of Republicans rejecting Trump in 2020 and going after him on the airwaves. But will their efforts make a difference at the ballot box? Mary Bruce has that story. At first glance, they may look like any other campaign ads. America knows Joe Biden. But what makes these ads unique? They're being made by members of the president's own party. Trump doesn't have the strength to lead, nor the character to admit it. It's an unprecedented move, brutal, blistering ads from a group of Republican strategists intent on taking down President Trump. We pull no punches. Um, we don't tell people about Donald Trump. We illustrate why he is unfit for office and how his actions, regardless of what they may be, uh, can further illustrate his inability and unwillingness to serve uh, in the role. It's called The Lincoln Project, and co-founder Reed Galen tells us many of the ads are intended for an audience of one. Hey, Donald. The goal, to get under the president's skin. There is no small amount of joy that it brings to uh, upset President Trump directly. Uh, there is a me method to the madness. And they aren't subtle. You've probably heard this before, but it was smaller than we expected. They're trying to beat Trump at his own game, and the strategy appears to be working. Take, for example, this ad mocking the president's performance at the annual West Point graduation. It's time we talk about this. Trump is not well. Just days later at his Tulsa campaign rally, the president went off script for 13 minutes defending that West Point appearance. Because I'm wearing leather bottom shoes, which is good if you're walking on flat surfaces. It's not good for ramps. For the Lincoln Project, that was a success. It's not about trolling the president, because as one of my partners says, if you're not trolling if you get someone on the hook. Needling the president is one thing. The big question, will any of this sway voters? The latest polls show the president is trailing former Vice President Joe Biden by double digits, but he still has 84 percent support among Republicans. And the president calls the Lincoln Project a bunch of losers and a disgrace to Honest Abe. But Trump's handling of the pandemic and the national reckoning on racism is clearly taking a toll on the president politically. And that's a positive sign for Republican strategist Tim Miller, an advisor on Jeb Bush's campaign who has remained a fervent never-Trumper. 
that there are millions of Donald Trump voters out there that we can persuade still uh, that are not the red hat wearing voters that show up to his rallies. His organization, Republican Voters Against Trump, is trying to make sure the voices of those frustrated Republicans are being heard. I voted for Donald Trump. My bad, fam. It's okay to put country over party. In fact, it's imperative to do that. If Joe Biden drops out and the DNC runs a tomato can, I will vote for the tomato can. Even getting the support of a former top official in the Trump administration. What we saw week in and week out, and for me after two and a half years in that administration, was terrifying. Our George Stephanopoulos interviewing former DHS Chief of Staff Miles Taylor. It's not that he would just tell us to do things that we would say are inappropriate, unethical or illegal. It's that he would continue to consistently tell us to do those same things. According to Taylor, that included a request to withhold federal aid from California during the 2018 wildfires. He didn't feel like he had a base of supporters in California. So as wildfires were burning down houses in the state, the president basically said to us, I don't care. He says more former Trump officials are planning on coming forward. The president hasn't heard the last of us. You could think of it as an opening salvo. We can help nudge them over into Joe Biden's camp using these messengers from people in their community rather than kind of wagging our finger at them. I do believe that a philosophically driven center-right party is healthy for the United States. We do not have that right now. They are now broadening their scope, targeting Republican senators who have sided with the president. Every time they had a choice between America and Trump, they chose Trump. It's not about just Donald Trump, although he is the prime target. It is about all of those people who failed their oaths of office. You'd be gutting your own party. Well, it's not our party anymore. And I guess that's what it comes down to then. It's For us, it's not even about the party. It's about the country. And if they succeed, what then? Some Republicans fighting for Biden are hoping for a return to bipartisanship. I believe we have a chance with Joe Biden to be at the table. Rosario Marin, the U.S. Treasurer under President George W. Bush, is part of a brand new organization, 43 alumni for Biden. We are better than this. We as a party are better than this man who has usurped that party. I remember many Republicans used to say, I'm going to hold my nose and vote for Trump. Well, look what that got us. As she watches Trump's response to this pandemic, Marin says she's more convinced than ever that her party and the country she immigrated to at a young age cannot survive another four years of President Trump. And what do we have here? The, the greatest nation in the world on its knees because of failed leadership. We can't have four more years of this. Hoping their message will resonate with just under 70 days to go till the election. Mary Bruce, ABC News, Washington. And let's bring back in our powerhouse roundtable. Mary, we'll start with you. We just heard from the Lincoln Project. They were talking about how this is designed largely for an audience of one. Clearly, this gets under the president's skin. But is that the ultimate goal or could this actually benefit the Biden campaign? Well, I think ultimately they would be more than happy if it did uh, influence the Biden campaign and help sway some voters in that direction. But they are blunt in saying that really the goal here is to get under the president's skin and really to throw him off his game. Anytime they feel that they can distract the president, uh, have him spend 10 minutes in a speech going on a tangent to defend himself against something that they targeted him on in an ad, they see that as a success. It is an opportunity for these Republicans to try and distract the president, to, to, to get him to change change his focus, and they see that as being beneficial to Joe Biden. Now, as for the Biden team, when I spoke with them about this, look, they, they, they are happy to have the help. But, but another thing here that I think is really fascinating is that these groups are able to do what Joe Biden politically simply cannot. He is trying to run a relatively positive campaign, not get dragged down in the mud with Donald Trump. These groups are more than happy to go there, right? They are hitting President Trump where it hurts and hoping that that will sway voters or at least uh, distract the president. President. All right, Mary, thanks. I want to bring in ABC News contributor Tara Setmeyer. You are a member of the Lincoln Project, and I'm curious, why is this any different than the Never Trump movement that failed in 2016? 
Well, first of all, um, in 2016, we didn't have a record for uh, Donald Trump as the president to run on to point out. Uh, we did have his failed record as a businessman and his character deficits, but people were willing to hold their nose and vote for him because of the disdain for Hillary Clinton. The dynamics politically in this race are completely different in 2020, and Donald Trump has a record for us to point out to the American people that is this really what you want another for another four years of. It, it just goes back to the Reagan mantra of, are you better off now than you were four years ago? And um, yes, some of, the, some of the ads are needling, but as we get closer to the election, you'll see that more and more of our ads are pointing out what America looks like now, how it's been upended under Trump, and why it's important for people, more positive messages of why it's more important for people to oust him and have a change of leadership than it is just needling. Matt Dowd, you have a lot of political professionals who are behind the Lincoln Project, who are a part of it, who are investing a lot of time. They're raising a lot of money to put these ads out there. Also, you know, you could also, the criticism is fair to the media. A lot of the media, especially cable news, has picked up these ads, so they're getting a lot of free publicity as well. But what's the real goal here? Is the goal to, to move votes or is the goal to get under Trump's skin? Well, you know, they are a very talented group of folks, most of which, most of which, most of whom I know very well because I worked for them either in George W. Bush's re-election campaign or in Arnold Schwarzenegger's re-election campaign in 2006. So they are very talented. To me, the goal shouldn't be to, to increase Biden's support among Republicans. That's not going to happen. Donald Trump has that locked up. But the interesting thing for, I think, the Lincoln Project is designed for, I think trolling Donald Trump and getting a reaction from him is just a fringe benefit. What I think they really want to do is those people who no longer consider themselves Republicans, which there's quite a few people, the number of people that self-identify as Republicans today is smaller than it's been in 20 years. So the group of people that say they're Republican is much smaller than it was before, though Donald Trump is solid with them. What they want to do is give a signal, virally mainly, virally mainly gets repeated over and over again, to those people who are former Republicans, left the party because of Donald Trump, and now are trying to figure out what to do, and they give them a directional signal that it's okay to vote for Joe Biden or that for the good of the country, vote for Joe Biden. So it's not going to add to Joe Biden's level of support among Republicans, it's going to give a signal to former Republicans that it's okay, you're with other people, vote for Joe Biden. And that, if they do that, that would be considered a success. Sarah, would you say that it's possible that some of these factions, if President Trump were to win a second term, would actually be able to impact policy? Uh, well, if President Trump wins a second term, I think these groups will find themselves even more ostracized than, um, than they are now. I think some of this is very personal, and it comes through in their advertising. Some of these folks may have uh, tried to work with Trump, weren't successful in doing so. Uh, some of them have legitimate complaints with him and don't believe that he should be the president. I'm always suspect of groups when they have nothing good to say. And this is my problem with the Lincoln Project. I, I appreciate the claims. Some of these are my former colleagues, too. And they have legitimate beefs the way he treated Jeb Bush and the Bush family and others. But an honest analysis of the Trump administration, and you can't find one positive thing to say, it really calls into question your motivation, your integrity, and your sincerity about about your efforts. And look, if they want a center-right mainstream Republican Party, going after Republican senators is a bad idea. If they think a completely dominated Democratic Washington, D.C. is going to produce any kind of policy results that they're going to be happy with, th then they're not even close to being Republicans. And Tara, you want to get a, in on a piece of this action here. It's interesting that, that our integrity is being questioned here because we're calling out Donald Trump's incompetence and his trampling on constitutional norms, institutions, and ideals, and also his absolute burning to the ground of what used to be Republican principles, that, which are no longer. So um, questioning our motivation, and I can tell you that for with certainty that no one in the Lincoln Project has ever tried to work for Donald Trump, um, that, that's, not, that's not really, uh, I think, a fair analysis here. What we're, so, what we're demonstrating is that none of the policy wins are worth what has happened to this country. There are 177,000 dead Americans. Millions of people are unemployed. We have uh, racial injustice and protests in the streets while we have a president that's hugging con the Confederacy. 
These are ex just some examples. On top of the foreign policy disaster, we don't even—we haven't even gotten into that, with the president of the United States going against almost all of the Republican orthodoxy when it comes to foreign policy, cozying up to our enemies like Russia and Erdogan and China. These are all things that we at the Lincoln Project feel as though present existential threats to the future of this country. We can hash out the policy differences later, but right now, that is the focus. So the good does not outweigh the bad when it comes to Donald Trump, and that's what we're trying to point out. When you have places like Arizona, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, um, uh, Michigan, where these are s crucial swing states, Florida, that's where the battleground states are going to be. And examples like Arizona, where you have Maricopa County that has that used to go Republican all the time um, for many, many years. From 2008 until 2020, you've had an increase in Arizona of independent voters registered of 50 percent. That is an area that is rife for uh, votes that can help oust Donald Trump. And we're hoping that our messages can get to those independents and those people and sway the, sway the election. It was, Arizona was only won by three percentage points. Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania was only 77,000 combined votes. It's going to be very, very close. So we are, to Matt Dowd's point, we are giving license to people who are uncomfortable with what Donald Trump has done as president, and we're giving them license to say it's okay to vote for Joe Biden this time around, and we can fight those policy fights out later. But right now, it's about protecting the republic. Sarah, your response? Well, look, I, again, I think she proved my point, which is that any honest analysis of the Trump administration, it, it's fair to criticize him for tweets and and, and sometimes. Uh, him getting emotion the better of himself. And I, I understand the complaint, and I understand where Republicans come from. I supported Jeb Bush in the primaries. But an honest analysis says, I don't think what he did on North Korea was right, and therefore I support Joe Biden. However, I'll give him credit for a very smart and thoughtful UAE-Israel deal. That is something very positive. And so when Republicans who don't support the president can't find one good thing, to say, it's just very hard to take them credibly. Terry Moran, I want to bring you in on this conversation. You know, we've heard of Reagan Democrats. Rahm Emanuel wants to talk about Biden Republicans. Is that what this is? I mean, does the Lincoln Project have real teeth or is this sort of fringy? You know, I think for a certain segment of Republicans, Tom, there is angst. I mean, this president has trashed uh, Republican principles on the budget, on, on America's role in the world, its, its uh, transatlantic alliance with European democracies, cozying up to people like Putin, the idealism of America's uh, mission in the world by essentially treating uh, dictators like Erdogan and Duterte and others better than, than close allies, uh, to, to say nothing of, of some of his policies here. So I think there is genuine what happened to my party feeling among a lot of Republicans. And for that sliver of the electorate, as Matt Dowd was pointing out, you know, these, these ads could be a, a signal. But I think most Americans are either they are already in camps that, that they are sure of, or they're looking beyond these ads. They're looking to what is going to happen to my life, what is he going to do, and what is Joe Biden's answer to that? John Ponder's story of transformation in the Rose Garden on the National Day of Prayer. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome him back to the White House. John's life is a beautiful testament to the power of redemption. John grew up without his father. As he tells it, my mother was strong, but she wasn't able to keep us out of the gangs and off of the streets, and they were violent streets. At the age of 38, he was arrested for bank robbery. While John was in prison, he began reading the Bible and listening to Christian radio. One day, he heard Reverend Billy Graham on the radio proclaim, Jesus wants to be Lord of your life. On that day, John dedicated his life to Christ. He spent the rest of his time in prison studying the Bible. When he was released, he heard a knock at his door. It was the officer who put him in jail, FBI Special Agent Richard Beasley, who said, I want you to know that I've been praying for you. Now, Richard and John are best friends, and we are grateful that Richard is here with us today. In the last 10 years since John was released, he has created one of the most successful reentry programs, Hope for Prisoners in Las Vegas. I was glad to speak there earlier this year. As John says, Hope for Prisoners is a movement that began as a dream in a tiny prison cell and is now making a difference in the lives of thousands, truly bringing hope 
that there is an opportunity and a community that is waiting and willing to offer them a second chance. John, we honor your devotion to showing returning citizens that they are not forgotten. We believe that each person is made by God for a purpose. I will continue to give all Americans, including former inmates, the best chance to build a new life and achieve their own American dream, and a great American dream it is. Now I'd like to ask John and Richard to say a few words. I can't tell you how grateful I am to have the opportunity to speak here today. Not so long ago, my life was running from the police, fearing the police, and avoiding the police. Not because of anything that the police had done to me personally, but due to the animosity I had allowed to grow inside of me, making me believe that they were my enemy. But today, praise God, I am filled with hope. A proud American citizen who has been given a second chance. My transformation began in a prison cell where I found myself a three-time convicted felon facing yet another sentence. I gave my life to Jesus and made him a promise that I would spend the rest of my days helping others like me. My first help and support came from the unlikeliest of places, the FBI agent who arrested me, Richard Beasley. He is now a dear friend and has been a source of encouragement to me throughout my entire journey. I am grateful for the men and women of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department who volunteer their time to people who are returning to our local community after incarceration. These are the real life heroes who put their lives on the line every day armed with the promise that they made to protect and to serve have made a tremendous impact in the lives of men and women reintegrating back into our society. My hope for America is that formerly incarcerated people will be afforded the opportunity to take advantage of the fact that we live in a nation of second chances. My hope for America is that law enforcement and people in the communities across our country can come together and realize that as Americans, we have more in common than we have differences. My hope for our great nation is to continue on this path we are on of being the most prosperous country in the world. I'm so proud of John with his life's turnaround and for all the lives that he's helped to change. It may be hard to believe that, as a retired FBI agent, one of my best friends is a person I arrested for bank robbery. When I met John 15 years ago, he was angry, scared, frustrated, and anxious about his future. On the drive to prison, I stopped at a convenience store and bought John a coffee and a donut. After he was sentenced, John sent me a necktie and a note thanking me for treating him like a gentleman. Five years later, when he got out of prison, John called me and wanted to meet for lunch. He was a different man. He talked about starting a re-entry program for men and women coming out of prison. Over time, John earned the trust and respect of the law enforcement community, many of whom volunteer in John's Hope for Prisoners program. I'm grateful for President Trump's commitment to criminal justice reform. On February 20th of this year, he was the guest speaker at the Hope for Prisoners graduation. He stayed much longer than scheduled to hand out diplomas to the 29 men and women who graduated that day. What a sight. The most important man in the free world shaking hands and pledging his administration's support to ex-offenders. Their families were there, the community was there. What a great second chance. I also appreciate President Trump's support for law enforcement. I always felt like I had strong support as an FBI agent, but there's nothing worse than knowing you're being second-guessed when you're doing your job. In certain parts of our country right now, law enforcement doesn't feel like they have the support from their local leaders. They're being painted with a broad brush, unfairly, with calls for defunding. But as President Trump knows, the overwhelming percentage of law enforcement officers are good, smart people who are doing their jobs very well. And they can change the world working with people like John. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite John's wife, Jamie, to join us as I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. So I don't know if you know that, Jamie. Come on over here. It's Thank just you. an honor. And uh, you have done incredible work. Thank you, sir. And all of Las Vegas and all of Nevada and all of every place in this country is very proud of you, the job you've done bringing people back. And you're right, I was supposed to be there for five minutes. I stayed for an hour you and a half. Yes. Because Sorry. it was so interesting to me. Congratulations to both. Thank and you, sir. Thank you. Richard, thank you very much for the job you do. Thank you. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. I think I'll give it to Jamie. What do you think? <laughs> We've just been watching a video of President Trump pardoning John Ponder there. He was a man convicted of bank robbery and then later turned around his life and started an organization called Hope for Prisoners that helped people who had been incarcerated basically reacclimate to life uh, to try to get jobs to make their lives better. I want to bring in Matt Dowd right now because, Matt, of course, the president will be criticized for this, for politicizing a pardon. But if you're a viewer at home, that was an incredibly compelling piece of video right there where, where you really saw some honesty between both John Ponder and also the FBI agent who arrested him. I think it was, I have two thoughts about it. One, it was incredibly powerful. I mean, you can't look at that, and I watched that as I watched it. As you say, it's incredibly compelling. It's incredibly purposeful and powerful in what he did. And so I think, I give the president credit for that. It was an unbelievable moment. On the other hand, you have to say, I know there's been talk about breaking norms and breaking traditions, that for the president to use the power of the presidency in pardon, to use as a PR move in the midst of a convention, is at best unethical. And so I think it was a powerful moment, and Godspeed to the man and the wife and what's happened to them, and gr grateful for what he's done with his life. But there is some serious questions about a president using that power in the midst of a political uh, convention. Terry Moran, those ethics questions aside, because others will, will debate that and, and, and figure out if, if anything wrong was done here, but I wonder the, the political points and, and the voters that are watching this, does this help the president going forward into November? It does. It does for one simple reason. You feel great about our country when you watch that, right? What a great story John Ponder is. And Richard Beasley, the FBI agent who arrested him, who calls him now one of his best friends. This is, this is what, what our ideals are about, equality, and that people who've paid their debt to society can come back and do something great. Uh, I, I feel good. I feel good about America after that. And I think it does send the signal for President Trump that he cares. Uh, about everyone, as I heard again and again last week in Pennsylvania from Trump supporters. He cares about everyone. He's not a racist. He's not, he's not out for himself. He loves this country and he loves everybody in it. And, and this is the kind of thing that, that we heard earlier that can humanize those hard, sharp, tough, sometimes dirty edges that he has uh, and, and give you a warm glow about this act, which is, as Matt Dowd points out, way over the line. But there's no check or balance on the pardon power. It is plenty. It is full. It's his. He can use it as he wants it, no matter what you think. Yvette, what do you think? I mean, we heard in Terry's assessment there and what the intention was for viewers that he's not a racist to kind of soften his edges. I don't think by the, sh the way you were shaking your head that it did it for you. Political pageantry. Again, he's parading out these African Americans to show mostly white Americans that he's not racist. But the reality is, is most people in this country remember how he treated the Central Park Five. The fact that he's done nothing to advance the cause of so many people on death row who are, pardon the people on death row whose evidence has shown that they're innocent. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the millions of black men who are still in jail for non-violent offenses because of the war on drugs. If you want to make an impact, make an impact. Parading one person out, and God bless him, I'm so glad that he's gotten pardoned, but the reality is he probably, we, we should erase his record anyway. People, once they've served their time, once they've done good things, we should have a country where you get to move forward anyway. Not that he gets to pick and choose the people he likes and he doesn't like. And I don't and, and I think I think the fact that he's an African-American and the fact that I know that every single thing that Donald Trump does around race is very intentional, as he does with the State of the Union every single year, makes me laugh. And it's really hurtful. If he really wants to show African-Americans that he cares, he should probably do that more intentionally in more broad ways. Sarah, your response. It was certainly, uh, whether you like President Trump or not, I think that a lot of people would feel like maybe that was kind of good TV, a highly produced reality TV so kind of moment. Stay here. Well, what, what I thought was so great about it is that, and I think that we didn't see this at all in the Democratic Convention, and we'll see more of it in this week, is, you know, this law enforcement and um, African Americans coming together. The, you know, we, we talk about this like it's a zero-sum game. You can't have uh, race relations move forward uh, with a strong law enforcement. And I, I thought that was a really beautiful story of redemption and friendship and it was great it was a great TV it was a great moment and I agree the president's going to eat uh, a whole uh, raft of criticism for it tomorrow but I think America loved it. Matt Dow let's take a step back what are you looking for tonight? 
I'm very interested in Melania's uh, speech. I, I think she's the prime Steve headliner Michael. tonight. I think it's uh, really important uh, for what she has to say, especially the criticism she got at the last convention uh, for borrowing um, uh, Michelle Obama's words. So I'm really interested, and I'm very curious to see if they stay on what we just saw and make it all positive to try to rebuild the president's image, because that's what they have to accomplish. Terry Moran, your thoughts for tonight. Well, I, I'm also uh, curious as to how positive this is going to be. I think the, the notion that the Republican Party need to communicate that, that Donald Trump is one of us, that, that, that in some way uh, you can connect with him, because Joe Biden's calling card is a 50-year career in politics where most people can trust his word, they like him, he's you know somebody you can do business with. And Donald Trump, for too many Americans, has just seemed like a great big fist or a club coming down on issue after issue, sometimes getting stuff done, sometimes breaking stuff, sometimes hurting people, sometimes helping them. But it's chaotic. And the person in there uh, who friends, uh, you know, say it can, can be a good guy and, and, a, and a fun guy to be around, I think, can they humanize a president who is fierce in his exercise of this power? Tara Setmeyer, last word to you. Well, I think that for uh, the, the traditional Republican conventions that we've seen in the past, and since there's no platform this year, we, re we really don't know what the party stands for outside of the uh, Donald Trump cult of personality. So I'm interested in seeing tonight if they try to put forth a more positive message that has a little bit more governing principles behind it, because otherwise, what are the American people choosing between? Lots more ahead. We'll be right back.
This is an ABC News special. President Trump's most loyal supporters take center stage. Tiffany Trump, Eric Trump, and live from the Rose Garden, the First Lady. Tonight, the grand old party is a family affair. Live from New York City and across the country, the Republican National Convention, now reporting Chief Anchor George Stephanopoulos. Good evening. Welcome to our continuing coverage of the Republican National Convention. Night two already underway, and for the second night in a row, the Trump family is front and center. The president's younger daughter, Tiffany Trump, will speak, as will his son, Eric, who now runs the family business with older brother, Don Jr. President Trump will appear again from the White House, continuing his unprecedented string of daily appearances on every day of both party conventions. And the headliner tonight, First Lady Melania Trump, delivering the highest profile speech of her life. White House base the convention floor tonight. Mary Bruce is there. Good evening, Mary. George, good evening. Well, we have never seen anything like this before. A first family using the People's House as a backdrop for a political convention. And in just a short time from now, the First Lady will step into the Rose Garden and into a political spotlight that she often tries to avoid. We are told her remarks will be uplifting and positive. That's a sharp contrast to the ominous tone and dire warnings that we heard from so many speakers last night. It is also expected to be a personal speech. The First Lady is going to be talking about her immigrant story, sharing her American dream. That is a bit of a tricky subject, given that her husband is running an anti-immigration campaign. The First Lady also has a bit of a political aim here tonight. She is trying to connect with women voters, those key suburban women whose support the president has been losing in many key battleground states. So the First Lady will be talking about the president as a husband and a father and perhaps trying to show a bit of his softer side. Mary George. Bruce, thanks very much. World News Tonight anchor David Muir is here. And David, as I just watch Mary giving that analysis from the White House, right at the front lawn of the White House, it, you, you're struck by how different this convention yeah, is. Yeah, I was thinking exactly the same yeah. thing, George. It really says it all. You know, you toss to Mary Bruce to cover the convention at the White House. Uh, and the open at 9 o'clock here, where you hear Tiffany Trump, Eric Trump, Melania Trump, uh, the family affair continues on night two of the convention. I think last night, even though it was titled, you know, Land of Promise, if you will, there was a lot of stoking of fears about what a Biden presidency would look like. That was the theme throughout the evening. And I wonder if we'll see any sort of pivoting tonight, because we know that kind of message works with the base, the, the people that you already have. Tonight, do they branch out and try to reach uh, independents or people who might have voted for Trump who didn't necessarily want to last time to try to convince him to do so again uh, this time? And of course, there's the pushing of the norms tonight, George. We'll be watching Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Uh, very rare if at all, for a Secretary of State, certainly a serving one, to give a speech. He'll do so from Jerusalem. And Melania Trump, as you point out, George, Mary Bruce is at the White House because Melania Trump will be in the Rose Garden tonight to give her address during a Republican convention. Lindsay Davis, this is the biggest speech of her life. She had a little bit of trouble four years ago when she was accused of taking portions of Michelle Obama's 2008 convention speech. Yeah, we just heard that she is going to focus largely on immigration. And because she's obviously the only the second uh, first lady in this country to be born uh, outside of the country. Lots of firsts all around tonight. You know, we just saw this uh, reality TV style moment a little while ago as the president gave a surprise pardon to John Ponder, uh, a, a convicted bank robber. Um, additionally, as David just mentioned, we're going to hear from uh, a secretary of uh, the secretary of state who's going to speak from foreign soil. And Mike Pompeo, let's rewind, in, in 2016, he was a fierce critic uh, of President President Trump. He said he would be an authoritarian who would ignore the Constitution. And he had said of the campaign, it's time to turn down the lights on the circus. Similarly, Senator Rand Paul also is going to be speaking tonight in 2016 when President Trump was running. Uh, he called him a fake conservative and a delusional narcissist. Now he's become one of his staunchest supporters in the Senate. I want to bring in, thank you, Liz. I want to bring in Chris Christie yeah. on this as well. You know, President Trump likes running as the outsider, the challenger to the status quo, the great disruptor. Tonight, through this convention, he's really owning the office. He is, and, and I've seen that over the last three and a half years, George, that he's gotten more and more comfortable with the idea of being president um, and actually the day-to-day -day work that he has to do and what that means for him now politically. And so he's gotten more comfortable with that, but you're still right. At core, 
he is that guy. He is the disruptor. He wants to see himself as the outsider. And what I think you'll see him starting to do is get on the attack on Biden even more than he's doing already and paint Biden as the personification of Washington insider, which isn't hard to do with somebody who's been in Washington, D.C. for 50 years. So I think you'll see him go in that direction. But doesn't that clash with Washington insider is a little bit different from socialist? Not necessarily if you believe, as the president does, that the insiders in the Democratic Party, the ones who are driving the train now, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and AOC, are the ones who are going to drive the agenda if Joe Biden becomes president. That's going to be the Trump argument. Now he's going to have to sell it. But that's the argument, that they have taken Washington and they're going to use this consummate Washington insider to be the conduit through which they push liberal policies that the country will not want. That's the Trump argument. Yvette Simpson, we saw the president use the power of the office earlier this evening delivering a pardon from the White House to a former uh, convict who's become an advocate for prison reform. Uh, so I commented a little bit earlier that, um, one, the tokenism and the chess pieces that he's pretending, uh, him bringing African-American people and granting pardons and him putting them on stage does not negate the fact that, you know, his policies around African-Americans, especially African-American men in prisons, is, are problematic. So we talked about Central Park Five, right, and his very, very accusatory way that he handled them, even though they ended up being innocent. The fact that he's giving pardons to people selectively but we know there are millions of black men who are serving time right now for nonviolent offenses around the war on drugs. The fact that there are innocent people who could be exonerated right now who are on death row. We're not seeing any of that affirmative work. And he's given out pardons like they're candy. He's doing it on TV during a convention like it's a game. And I also want to just, I didn't get to say this earlier, that he's also, I think, waging this war of good black people and bad black people. You know, you hear him talking about violence and and and. and and rioters and, all, and and then he's like but this guy here he's someone who who had a rough start but he turned his life around all the others they're bad people they don't deserve a second chance they don't deserve to be seen as positive people sure. that that juxtaposition isn't wasted on african americans i will tell you quickly that. george to to george is as the only one here who's given pardons and i have they're always selective you get pardons presented to you, you get cases made to you, you select, you decide, and it means a hell of a lot to the person you give that pardon to. Absolutely. And so, so to, but no, 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 that's not you what you said. You also gave a pardon to you, 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 too. You, you, so. you demeaned what happened tonight. No, I didn't. And yes, you did. It was, it's and, it's and political you, pageantry, no, you, Governor. Yeah, let me he, tell you something. He, he, he put pageantry. that man out there. It's he put not that pageantry. man out there. And, it's and not pageantry they, to that family. It's not pageantry. He didn't that have to do it that way. To. He didn't have to do it that way. He presented that man in front of America during this week, as he has. He happens to be an African American man. He presented him as a guy. He also had him next to the guy who arrested him, saying that, "Oh, I'm so glad this guy well, they arrested." They have developed me. a friendship. They well, guess a friendship. what? The, the president didn't make that up. Ninety, ninety-five. He, 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 he was selective, though. He was selective. Okay, we are we're so well behaved. We get three more minutes. <laughs> Ron, we just saw some flashes right there. We also saw a lot of flashes l last night of, of heat um, at taking on the, the Biden-Kamala Harris ticket. It does appear that tonight is set up to uh, focus more on an, on an optimistic message. It does appear, but I just want to flash back to 24 hours ago. They were going into Monday saying there's going to be a very optimistic, uh, rosy period. And as soon as he went on stage, it went immediately to carnage, dark, rant, rage. He cannot stay with a script. Now, you may say this is going to go there. I also want to say this. You have three and a half years where the country has seen and taken an impression of this president. You cannot start to redraw an image of who he is. It's not going to last, and he needs it to last all the way through November beyond. I don't see that's possible. I think this is a misnomer that somehow we're going to give people a different image of who this president is for these four days, and then he's going to stick to it. And he never has. So to me, this is not what I would be doing for this president. I mean, I think if they would follow Scott, not just as one speaker, but an entire narrative, then they could pull it off, but they can't. They have Scott here and 10 other speakers in this rant and rage and carnage debate. Sarah Fagan, that is the real question. Can the party develop a single script and stick to it? Well, it's going to be challenging because... <laughs> <laughs> I agree with her. <laughs> This is how we work it out. This I, isn't. This, this I isn't. Agree there too. This isn't. <laughs> we all agree. Let her talk. This is an unorthodox president. Having said that, 
Tim Scott was a great moment in the Republican convention. I think Melania Trump will, will do fantastic tonight. And for her sake, I hope she does. She was ill served four years ago and she will uh, be able to put some real soft edges uh, around her husband. Her other children, his other children, her stepchildren, um, are softer than Don Jr. So I don't think we're going to see that tonight. Okay, thank you. We're going to tune in now to the floor cast. Sissy Graham Lynch is going to be speaking. She's the granddaughter of Billy Graham. I'm Sissy Graham Lynch, and I'm honored to speak to you tonight about something that is so important to all of us, our faith. As Americans, we know the first line of the First Amendment protects our freedom of religion. But what we often forget, the actual words are free exercise of religion. That means living out our faith in our daily lives, in our schools, in our jobs, and yes, even in the public square. Our founders did not envision a quiet, hidden faith. They fought to ensure that the voices of faith were always welcomed, not silenced, not bullied. But during the Obama-Biden administration, these freedoms were under attack. Democrats tried to make faith organizations pay for abortion-inducing drugs. Democrats tried to force adoption agencies to violate their deeply held beliefs. Democrats pressured schools to allow boys to compete in girls' sports and use girls' locker rooms. Those are the facts. But then, we the people elected Donald Trump. People of faith suddenly had a fierce advocate in the White House. He appointed judges who respect the First Amendment. He supported religious beliefs in court. He ensured religious ministries would not be forced to violate their beliefs. He withdrew the policies that placed our little girls at risk. And on the world stage, President Trump became the first president to talk about the importance of religious freedom at the United Nations, giving hope to people of faith around the world. In America, we have not yet experienced physical persecution, even though the left has tried to silence us. Even during the pandemic, we saw how quickly life can change. Some Democratic leaders tried to ban church services while marijuana shops and abortion clinics were declared essential. But you know what truly is essential? Our right to worship freely and live our faith in every aspect of life. The Biden-Harris vision for America leaves no room for people of faith. Whether you're a baker, a florist, or a football coach, they will force the choice between being obedient to God or to Caesar, because the radical left's God is government power. So in the words of my grandfather, Billy Graham, let us stand for political freedom, moral freedom, religious freedom, and the rights of all Americans, and let's never give in to those who would attempt to take it from us. Tonight, I'm proudly standing in that public square, and I hope and pray you will join me in voting to reelect President Trump. I am Bob Vosolovich, mayor of Eblith, a small town in the Iron Range of Minnesota. My father and grandfather earned their livings mining the raw materials that made the steel that built America. This election is a make or break for workers who are carrying on the legacy of men like them. Since the Iron Range economy is vulnerable to economic trends and to foreign trade, we have always needed a strong voice in Washington. We looked to Democrats to fill that void for many years because we actually thought they cared about our welfare. Not anymore. The radical environmental movement has dragged the Democratic Party so far to the left they can no longer claim to be advocates of the working man. This is hard for me to say because I am a lifelong Democrat. But for far too long, members of both parties allowed our country to be ripped off by our trading partners, especially China, who dumped steel into our markets and slapped tariffs on our products. And what did so-called leaders like Joe Biden do? Nothing. The human cost has been devastating, we lost thousands of jobs. We lost a generation of young people who had to leave the Iron Range to find a livelihood. And worst of all, we lost hope. Then something unexpected happened. 
A straight-talking New Yorker burst onto the scene, promising to stand up to China and the rest of the world on behalf of the American worker. Four years later, the Iron Range is roaring back to life, and we have one man to thank, President Donald Trump. He made good on his promises by cutting our taxes, rolling back senseless regulations, and delivering trade deals that put America's interests first. But the fight is not over. Joe Biden has allowed radicals like AOC to craft his environmental policies. Their so-called Green New Deal is a job-killing disgrace dreamt up by people who don't live in the real world. But Biden is too weak, too scared, and too sleepy to stand up to the radical left. He has been doing nothing in Washington for 47 years. Why would year 48 be any different? President Trump won't back down to anybody. He delivered the best economy in our history, and he will do it again for all of us. The Iron Range's economic future and survival is at stake, and so is America's. We know we can count on President Trump to fight for us and win. Let's make sure he wins on November 3rd. God bless America. My name is Abby Johnson, and I spent eight years working for Planned Parenthood, but today I am a pro-life activist. When I was in college, Planned Parenthood approached me at a volunteer fair. They talked about helping women in crisis and their commitment to keep abortion safe, legal, and rare. I was convinced to volunteer and later offered a full-time job as a medical assistant before my promotion to director of the clinic. I truly believed I was helping women, but things drastically changed in 2009. In April, I was awarded Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year Award and invited to their annual gala where they present the Margaret Sanger Award, named for their founder. And Margaret Sanger was a racist who believed in eugenics. Her goal when founding Planned Parenthood was to eradicate the minority population. Today, almost 80% of Planned Parenthood abortion facilities are strategically located in minority neighborhoods. And every year, Planned Parenthood celebrates its racist roots by presenting the Margaret Sanger Award. Later in August, my supervisor assigned me a new quota to meet, an abortion quota. I was expected to sell double the abortions performed the previous year. When I pushed back, underscoring Planned Parenthood's public-facing goal of decreasing abortions, I was reprimanded and told, abortion is how we make our money. But the tipping point came a month later when a physician asked me to assist with an ultrasound guided abortion. Nothing prepared me for what I saw on the screen. An unborn baby fighting back, desperate to move away from the suction. And I'll never forget what the doctor said next. Beam me up, Scotty. The last thing I saw was a spine twirling around in the mother's womb before succumbing to the force of the suction. On October 6th, I left the clinic, looking back only to remember why I now advocate so passionately for life. I founded and currently run, and then there were none, a nonprofit organization that's helped nearly 600 abortion workers transition out of the industry. For most people who consider themselves pro-life, abortion is abstract. They can't even conceive of the barbarity. They don't know about the products of conception room and abortion clinics where infant corpses are pieced back together to ensure nothing remains in the mother's wombs. Or that we joked and called it the pieces of children room. You see, for me, abortion is real. I know what it sounds like. I know what abortion smells like. Did you know abortion even had a smell? I've been the perpetrator to these babies, to these women, and I now support President Trump because he has done more for the unborn than any other president. 
During his first month in office, he banned federal funds for global health groups that promote abortion. That same year, he overturned an Obama-Biden rule that allowed government subsidy of abortion. He appointed a record number of pro-life judges, including two Supreme Court justices. And importantly, he announced a new rule protecting the rights of health care workers objecting to abortion, many of whom I work with every day. Life is a core tenant of who we are as Americans. And this election is a choice between two radical anti-life activists and the most pro-life president we have ever had. That's something that should compel you to action. Go door to door, make calls, talk to your neighbors and friends, and vote on November 3rd. Take action that reelects our president and do it with our very most vulnerable Americans in mind, the ones who haven't been born yet. It began as a class trip to join thousands for the annual March for Life. These Catholic young men traveled from Kentucky to stand up for what they believed in. But what happened was something very different. Crackers will make America great hat on. You little dirty crackers, your day coming. Young Klansmen. Look at our Make America Great Again hat. Social media, the news, and even celebrities launched a campaign of persecution that was completely false against a boy in a Make America Great Again hat. The MAGA hat carries a certain connotation that provokes a conditioned reaction. I blame that kid. What a little crap. Everyone that sees that smug look wants to punch that kid. Nicholas Sandman received death threats and his school was forced to close. Tonight, Nicholas tells his story. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nick Sandman, and I'm the teenager who was defamed by the media after an encounter with a group of protesters on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial last year. Before I begin, I'd like to thank President Trump for the opportunity to share some of my story and why it matters so much to this November's election. In 2019, I attended the March for Life in Washington, D.C., where I demonstrated in defense of the unborn. Later that day, I bought a Make America Great Again hat because our president, Donald Trump, has distinguished himself as one of the most pro-life presidents in the history of our country, and I wanted to express my support for him, too. Looking back now, how could I possibly imagine that the simple act of putting on that red hat would unleash hate from the left and make myself the target of network and cable news networks nationwide? Being from Kentucky, the birthplace of Abraham Lincoln, my classmates and I visited the Lincoln Memorial. I found myself face to face with Nathan Phillips and other professional protesters looking to turn me into the latest poster child showing why Trump is bad. While the media portrayed me as an aggressor with a relentless smirk on my face, in reality, the video confirms I was standing with my hands behind my back and an awkward smile on my face that hid two thoughts. One, don't do anything that might further agitate the man banging a drum in my face. And two, I was trying to follow a family friend's advice, never to do anything to embarrass your family, your school, or your community. Before I knew what was happening, it was over. One of Mr. Phillips' fellow agitators yelled out, we got him. It's all right here on video, and we won, Grandpa. What I thought was a strange encounter quickly developed into a major news story complete with video footage. My life changed forever in that one moment. The full war machine of the mainstream media revved up into attack mode. They did so without researching the full video of the incident without ever investigating Mr. Phillips' motives, or without ever asking me for my side of the story. And do you know why? Because the truth was not important. Advancing their anti-Christian, anti-conservative, anti-Donald Trump narrative was all that mattered. And if advancing their narrative ruined the reputation and future of a teenager from Covington, Kentucky, well, so be it. That would teach him not to wear a mega hat, 
I learned what was happening to me had a name. It was called being canceled, as in annulled, as in revoked, as in made void. Canceled is what's happening to people around this country who refuse to be silenced by the far left. Many are being fired, humiliated, or even threatened. And often, the media is a willing participant. But I would not be canceled. I fought back hard to expose the media for what they did to me, and I won a personal victory. While much more must be done, I look forward to the day that the media returns to providing balanced, responsible, and accountable news coverage. I know President Trump hopes for that too. And I know you'll agree with me when we say that no one in this country has been a victim of unfair media coverage more than President Donald Trump. In November, I believe this country must unite around a president who calls the media out and refuses to allow them to create a narrative instead of reporting the facts. I believe we must join a president who will challenge the media to return to objective journalism. And together, I believe we must all embrace our First Amendment rights and not hide in fear of the media or from the tech companies or from the outrage mob either. This is worth fighting for. This is worth voting for. And this is what Donald Trump stands for. Thank you all for listening to me tonight. And one more thing. Let's make America great again. There's Nicholas Salmon right there. We should tell you he's filed multi-million dollar lawsuits against a number of media outlets, including ABC News. He's been claiming defamation. That case continues. We're going to take a quick break. Tiffany Trump is coming up. We'll be right back.
again, George Stephanopoulos. National Convention. I want to bring in our senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. And Terry, as I was watching those speeches in the last segment, I had flashbacks to the 1990s and that phrase we came to know then, culture wars. Mm, and that is what this election is about in many ways. The Republican Party, Make America Great Again, is an idealistic vision of America that looks backwards to a time when we were more rooted in traditional faith structures, when the economy was more local, uh, when there was, uh, frankly, less demographic diversity and diversity of outlooks and lifestyles than there is today. The Democratic Party looks the other way, uh, to multi-faith and non-faith America, to an America that's very demographically different and a knowledge-based economy that knows no borders. Those are identity issues. And around them are these cultural issues that flare up. We heard from Billy Graham's granddaughter uh, that cried for an America that is more rooted in those traditional faith structures. Uh, and when you have those kinds of loyalties, like uh, like the, that was uh, evinced in the, in the Covington ish, issue, it's just so intense. It's so fierce. And that's why this election is so painful intense for so many people. And Cecilia Vega, it creates something of a, of a split screen as well. As you're watching the primetime speeches, the ones that are on all of the networks, those you see the speakers trying generally to reach out to a broader audience from both parties, but in these, these speeches that are happening before primetime, hardcore tailored messages to the base of the party at both the Democratic and Republican conventions. Yeah, for sure. But George, the big issue for the Republicans right now is that they really need to expand beyond Donald Trump's base. And I've heard that time and time again in talking with Republicans on Capitol Hill who are so fearful right now that they very well could lose the Senate come November if they don't in fact expand beyond the president's base in this election. And when you hear from young people like Nicholas Sandman, uh, he's not talking about policy. He's not talking about the president's handling of the coronavirus. So that is not going to help him expand beyond the base. But it, you're right, it is red meat for that, that small group of voters there. Cecilia Vega, thanks very much. Tiffany Trump is coming up. And right now, let's go back to the convention floor at the Mellon Center. Pam Bondi, of course, she was one of the president's representatives during the impeachment uh, proceedings is finishing her speech. Then we'll see a video of women working in the White House. Our president is in this to build a safer, better and stronger America. And he will finish what he started to keep this a real land of opportunity for everyone. If you want to check your voting status, secure your ballot or register to vote, Text VOTE to 88022. Remember, the best is yet to come. Women have played a very, very big role. Uh, the level of genius is unbelievable, frankly. You're what? You've got 70, 80 years on this earth? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to make that difference? Are you going to say, I was there for the big battles in our country to save America? It's what I feel very much called to do ever since I was a very young girl. In 2016, Donald Trump made his historic run for the office of United States President. Knowing the monumental task he would be undertaking, he rested all of his hopes for winning on one woman. Because of that trust, he became the 45th President of the United States, and Kellyanne Conway became the first woman in U.S. history to manage a winning presidential campaign. This president has been a champion for women, mostly because he speaks to them as if they can handle and tackle all issues. I don't want a job because of my gender. I want the job because I'm the best person for that position. That's it. And he respects that. And he appreciates hard work. You can't ask for anything better, especially in a boss. <laughs> 
President Trump continues to place strong women into significant positions throughout his administration and campaign, far more than any other president in U.S. history. That he has had and does have more women on his top team than any president before, but it actually goes down to his deputy assistants, to his special assistants, to our awesome teams throughout the West Wing. And when he called me and said, I want you to represent my entire campaign, I became the first black woman to represent a Republican presidential campaign, winning presidential campaign in United States history. Throughout his career, Trump has always touted family first as a core value. He shows this especially with his choices of press secretaries, choosing Sarah Sanders, the first mother to become a press secretary, Stephanie Grisham, the first single mother to serve as press secretary, and Kaylee McEnany, who transitioned into the job while also transitioning into the job of mom. I have four children, Kelly and Conway has four children, Ivanka has, I think between all the senior staff women, we might have 75 kids. I'm not sure, we've lost count, but the importance of the work is never lost on any of us. And truly, it is those children that we are fighting for and for their future. With these capable women placed in positions of powerful influence and authority, President Trump has proven that when the stakes are highest, he is proud to entrust many of our nation's most crucial jobs to women. The number of dedicated, amazing, brilliant, relentless women that are dedicated to the country and to the president and to preserving the American dream is one of the greatest, if not the greatest things I'll ever be a part of. Only the president would say, let's take that stay home mom and have her run the party. What a smart guy. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Tiffany Trump. Since speaking at the Republican convention four years ago, so much has changed for the world, for our country, and for my family. Like so many students across the world, I graduated from law school during the pandemic. Our generation is unified in the facing the future in uncertain times. And many of us are considering what kind of country we want to live in. As a recent graduate, I can relate to so many of you who might be looking for a job. My father built a thriving economy once, and believe me, he will do it again. This election, I urge each and every one of you to transcend political boundaries. This is a fight for freedom versus oppression, for opportunity versus stagnation, a fight to keep America true to America. I urge you to make judgment based on results and not rhetoric. If you believe in criminal justice reform, there is only one president that passed the First Step Act, giving people a second chance, a chance at a life once again. And if you believe in expanding quality and affordable health care, only President Trump, my father, signed the right to try into law, the favored nations clause, and other actions to lower drug prices and keep Americans from getting ripped off. People must recognize that our thoughts, our opinions, and even the choice of who we are voting for may and are being manipulated and visibly coerced by the media and tech giants. If you tune into the media, you get one biased opinion or another. And what you share, if it does not fit into the narrative that they seek to promote, then it is either ignored or deemed a lie, regardless of the truth. This manipulation of what information we receive impedes our freedoms. Rather than allowing Americans the right to form our own beliefs, this misinformation system keeps people mentally enslaved to the ideas they deem correct. This has fostered unnecessary fear and divisiveness amongst us. Why are so many in media and technology and even in our own government so invested in promoting a biased and fabricated view? Ask yourselves, why are we prevented from seeing certain information? Why is one viewpoint promoted while others are hidden? The answer is control, because division and controversy breed a profit. But what are the consequences when only one side of the story gets out or when only one viewpoint is acceptable? 
for our education system. It meant sacrificing civil debate by creating an atmosphere where students with contrary opinions are too afraid to speak. Many students find themselves suppressing their beliefs to fit into what the acceptable group think is. In short, our nation suffers by inhibiting our diversity of thought and inclusion of ideas. Working together outside of our political comfort zones will accomplish so much more. Some cynical politicians do not seem to believe in the miracle of America. Well, I do. As Maximo Alvarez said so eloquently last night, if freedom is lost in this country, there is nowhere else to go. Having hope is not weakness, and believing in miracles is a gift from God. So tonight, I want to tell you the uncensored truth of what we believe in. We believe in equality of opportunity. We believe in freedom of thought and expression. Think what you want, seek out the truth, learn from those with different opinions, and then freely make your voice heard to the world. We believe in school choice because a child's zip code in America should not determine their future. We believe in freedom of religion for all faiths, and we believe in the American spirit, a country founded on ideas, not identity, a country where our differences are embraced, and the only country where the word dream has been attached to it. Because in America, your life is yours to chart. So if you're hearing these things and thinking to yourself, that is the kind of country that I want to live in. Well, whether you realize it or not, you are a Trump supporter. I encourage you to see beyond the facade that so many other politicians employ. They mask themselves in disguises of decency as they try to pressure us to mask our own identities and beliefs. My father is the only person to challenge the establishment, the entrenched bureaucracy, big pharma and media monopolies to ensure that Americans' constitutional freedoms are upheld and that justice and truth prevail. My father does not run away from challenges, even in the face of outright hatred, because fighting for America is something he will sacrifice anything for. He dreams big dreams for our country, and he is relentless at achieving them. You see, Make America Great Again is not a slogan for my father. It is what drives him to keep his promise of doing what is right for American citizens. The energy of change and opportunity is with us. God has blessed us with unstoppable spirit, his spirit, the American spirit. My dad has proven to be driven by that spirit. He has demonstrated his faith and his uncompromising heart and actions. My father has made me believe that America can truly be great again. If you care about living your life without restraints, about rebelling against those who would suppress your voice and building your American dream, then the choice in this election is clear. A vote for my father, Donald J. Trump, is a vote to uphold our American ideals. Be true to yourself and stay true to the dream of America. Thank you, and God bless you all. Tiffany Trump, younger daughter of Donald Trump, there speaking at the Mellon Auditorium in Washington, D.C., modulating her tone for speaking directly to camera to that empty uh, arena there in Washington, but a pretty hard-edged uh, message about the media as well. I want to bring in Tom Yamas. Tom, uh, Tiffany Trump not as active during the 2016 campaign. As I said there, she had a soft tone in her voice, but a tough message. That's right. You know, during the 2016 campaign, she was going through college through the University of Pennsylvania, her father's, her father's alma mater. She did have a smaller role, but if Donald Trump is your father, he's the center of of your universe, and all the Trump children play a role, whether large or small, in his life and in his presidency. He wants people to hear from his children. He's incredibly proud of all his children. Anytime they were there with him at campaign rallies, he'd ask them to come up and speak again. Tiffany, a much smaller role. But I was thinking about the roles of all the children, George, because I had a chance to sit down with Don Jr. and Eric. Eric will hear from tonight. Don Jr., we heard from him yesterday. And when I interviewed them, I asked him, you know, are you guys a little bit jealous that your father's taking Yvonne 
Ivanka to the White House. You know, it's no secret the president has a, a secret spot in his heart for Ivanka and Jared Kushner. But Don Jr., I'll, I'll never forget, he told me he wasn't jealous, that they're all going to work together and they were going to run the company. But it's interesting, George, over the last four years, I think you could make the argument Don Jr. has actually been more effective for the president in what he wants to accomplish, at least with his base and getting out there, than maybe Ivanka. And I say this because we heard that speech last night. The president still needs those ambassadors to the MAGA movement, the, the, the people who are really just so wild, who love the president, and that person is Don Jr., and he can always go to Don Jr. to defend him on Twitter, to speak to those fringe conservative groups, and to deliver the kind of speech he did last night. We'll see what Eric has to say tonight. We just heard from Tiffany, but it really is interesting how these Trump children have sort of carved their own roles throughout this administration. That's a great point. I want to bring that to Chris Christie. It, it is true. If you look at Don Jr. on the one hand, he's uh, the emissary to Fox and MAGA country, and Ivanka it generally puts out messages where she's suggesting that perhaps she's trying to soften the president up, reach out to a broader audience. Yeah, listen, I think they're all looking for their role. They're all looking for their lane, and I don't think that's unusual in most families, except in most families it doesn't happen in public, um, on television and in rallies and all the rest. I think each one of those children um, wants their father's approval. Um, wants their father's acceptance and wants to feel like they're contributing something positively either to the business when he was running that and now to the business and the, and the political careers. And I think, you know, Don Jr., as I've gotten to know him over the years, um, relates very much to that part of the president's base. He's a hunter himself. He's an outdoorsman. He's a guy who um, has kind of walked his own path, different than Eric and Ivanka. And so uh, they're all trying to find their own way um, with a father who takes most of the spotlight. Yeah, most of the time. Rahm, I mean, I wonder, though, how effective this is to a broader audience. You see an unusual number, not only of family members, but also of White House staffers speaking in this convention. Larry Kudlow, Pam Biondi. Uh, that is different as well. Totally different. It's totally uh, different. I think you, I mean, I keep asking myself one question when I hear every speaker. You have a president of the United States going into an election right now at the end of, so we're knocking on the door of Labor Day. He's nine points down. Does this help narrow that gap, or does it just keep it static? Remember, this has basically been a static election for seven weeks. And the only question to every speaker, everything they say, hot, cold, aggressive, base, reach out. Are they going to narrow that nine points? No president has gone into well, an election this far down. do you see a single strategy at this convention so far? What's that? Do you see a single strategy at this convention? No, I actually think it's helter-skelter. And the, I mean, there's a softness with certain speakers towards the end. I think you'll see that today with Melania, et cetera, and with Senator Scott yesterday. But everything else is of one type. I mean, I'm telling you, they're spending a lot of time on the media bashing it, which works with the base. Not much with the swing voters they need to get over the top in the seven electoral states that count. Yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that. So I think Tiffany Trump... You have to copy them, though. That's right. I, <laughs> Tiffany Trump was, to me, kind of a bow on a section of the convention, which is an important part of the Republican base, which is religious conservatives, which is the pro-life movement. And I thought she did a really nice job of, of really tying what I think is going to become a growing issue in partisan politics, which is if you're a Christian and you have a different alternative view than the mainstream in this country, your, your views aren't acceptable. And a lot of people are feeling this way. And she talked about it on technology. This is a growing theme uh, in the right. Um, you know, I, I would also point out that uh, uh, this y young woman who spoke uh, earlier tonight, uh, uh, Dr. Graham's niece, you know, she brought up something that I thought was really important around partial birth abortion. And Joe Biden has, an avowed Catholic, talks about it all the time. I believe he is sincere. However, why is he, you know, attacking the little sisters of the poor? This is an important theme in this election, which is. For a section of the convention, these are important issues that need to be discussed, and they're very important to the Republican Party. Sarah Fagan, thanks very much. We want to tune in back to the convention floor now. Mike Pence, Vice President Mike Pence, in a video. For all. Jack is an eight-year-old from Wisconsin who was struggling academically and socially in school. But Jack's mom, Sarah, who works three jobs to support her son, applied for Wisconsin's school choice voucher program. 
we're glad that we were able to get the school choice voucher to go to that school. With Jack, he would have slipped through the cracks in public schools, um, and having the option to go to a school that fits him has been a real game changer for us, and I know that because of that opportunity that he's going to succeed and he's going to um, achieve that goal of being an apparatus engineer, if that's what he chooses to stick with. <laughs> Laura McLinn is a mother of another inspiring boy, Jordan. Jordan has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a fatal muscle weakening disorder. Jordan was at my side in Indiana when, as governor, I signed a law allowing terminally ill patients to access experimental drugs not yet approved by the FDA. In 2018, President Trump signed the landmark federal right to try bill into law. Thanks to the president's leadership, critically ill patients have the right to access life-saving experimental treatments. We started fighting for right to try, which basically says if you have a terminal illness and there's a drug that exists and you don't qualify for the clinical trial, there's no other way to receive it. This is a unique pathway that allows you to have access. You made us a promise back in Indiana that you would do whatever it took to help Jordan, and um, we're so grateful that you joined us on this journey and um, stuck it out until it became law so that other people could access treatments. So Jordan, if President Trump was standing right there, what would you say to him today about Right to Try? Thank you for being a hero to everybody in the country. <laughs> Judge Cheryl Allen made history in 2007 when she became the first African-American woman to be elected to serve on the Pennsylvania Superior Court. It's because of leaders like Judge Allen that our nation has overcome our greatest challenges. In this time of uh, racial division in the country, yes. do you see faith and values and Absolutely. the strong stand that President Trump has taken for equality of opportunity as a pathway toward bringing the country together? As a um, senior citizen, I'll leave it at that, I know what racism feels like, mm -hmm. but I also know that but for my being in this country, I would have never been able to achieve um, the things that I have been able to achieve. There are injustices, but the way to deal with those injustices is for people to sit down across the table and talk and come up with solutions. I do believe that President Trump is committed to that. In 2016, I have to confess that I really did not know um, candidate Trump at the time, but I have to say that he really won me over. Gino's a truck driver from Ohio who heard politicians for years make empty promises about defending American jobs only to see those promises broken again and again. But in 2019, when General Motors closed its plant in Lordstown, Ohio, President Donald Trump refused to stand by and watch it happen. And as Gino observed, this president reached out to General Motors to find a way to bring jobs back to Lordstown. And plans were soon set into motion to create Lordstown Motors. President Trump says, this is how we fix it. And I thought, well, that's a simple solution. There's no other president could have done it. There's no one that has ever tried to do it. President Trump's a doer. He appreciates every one of us, and I know he does. I've seen it. When he said, make America great again, that was his task. That wasn't, that wasn't his slogan. That was his task. And every hat you see that says MAGA on it, that's what your president's doing for you. Thank you, Mr. President, for keeping the promises that you made. And then there's Pastor Aaron Johnson. Today, he's the executive director of the Tulsa Dream Center, a nonprofit that provides education and medical services and food to those in need. AJ, you've got a great personal story. When you see the way this president, this administration have been leaning in to create opportunities, investments in communities around the country to create jobs, expanding educational choice. What, what does that mean to the families that you serve every day? It means so much to our families. I did grow up in a single parent home. 
home. And so we serve over 600 boys and girls right now on a daily basis, even in COVID. And so for us to give these moms to have an opportunity to take more money on their check, on their paycheck home back to them, to have their children be able to go to a school that they may not have the opportunity to otherwise, it means so much to us. There's been so much greater opportunity for individuals to come together in any walk of life. People have really been able to see such a positive change and been filled with hope, especially throughout this time. Lydia left hearth and home, friends and family in Honduras to pursue a better life here in America. While raising their four daughters, Lydia and her husband run a small business that creates security systems. But just months after their business was up and running, our nation was struck by a global pandemic. That's when President Donald Trump stepped in and enacted the largest financial relief package in American history. Her small business stayed in business, and her American dream kept running strong. What did the Paycheck Protection Program mean to your company as the coronavirus struck? Yeah, it was a huge, tremendous help and a big blessing. And so we applied, we were accepted really quickly. We we're so grateful. You can't believe how much relief we have. We want to continue serving our clients. We want to continue growing our economy, right? We want to all continue to move forward. So we were able to make it. Because of the support of family and friends, the government, um, I tell my children, you know, they are born here in the U.S. And I tell them, you are so blessed to live in America. Here at Abraham Lincoln's boyhood home, a young man would grow up to become the first Republican president of the United States. And today, another Republican president is fighting to preserve that same noble legacy of freedom. And President Donald Trump will make certain that the torch of American opportunity illuminates every city, every town, and every community in this blessed land. Hi. Our network coverage is coming up. Melania Trump, the headliner tonight. We'll be right back.
This is an ABC News special. President Trump's most loyal supporters take center stage. Moments from now, his son Eric Trump, then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and from the Rose Garden, the First Lady Melania Trump. Live from New York City and across the country, the Republican National Convention, now reporting Chief Anchor George Stephanopoulos. Good evening and welcome to our special coverage of the Republican National Convention. Before last week, we had never seen a virtual party convention, a roll call of the states from the states. A candidate delivers acceptance speech to an empty room. That's how the Democrats chose to campaign within the constraints of the coronavirus. President Trump and the Republicans are responding this week with a different break from tradition, bringing brand new meaning to a time-worn political cliche, the Rose Garden strategy. It's more than a metaphor now. That's where First Lady Melania Trump will deliver her speech tonight. The site of President Trump's acceptance speech on Thursday. We'll also see him from the iconic East Room tonight. Mike Pompeo will become the first Secretary of State in modern times to give a political speech to a party convention when he beams in for, on a diplomatic mission to the Middle East. Mary Bruce is at the White House, and Mary, all presidents try to capitalize on the trappings of the office when they run for re-election. This convention taking it to a whole new level. George, this is a familiar setting here, but we have never seen anything like this before. A first family using the White House, the People's House, as the backdrop for a political convention. Critics say it crosses a moral line, but the president is intent on using the trappings of the incumbency to make his case for re-election. So here in just a short time, the first lady will step into the Rose Garden and make the highest profile speech of her life. We are told these are going to be uplifting and forward-looking remarks. That's a sharp contrast with the more ominous tone that we heard from the speakers last night. And these are expected to be personal remarks. The first lady speaking as an immigrant about her American dream. That's going to be a fine line for her to walk, given the fact that the president is running a, a, a campaign that is very much anti-immigration. The first lady is also expected to make a direct appeal to women. President Trump is losing support from women in key battleground states. Tonight, Melania Trump will have a chance to try and win them back. Mary George. Bruce, thanks very much. We're here with World News tonight. Anchor David Muir as well. They're speaking from the House and family is front and center. No question this is a family affair, George. And how many conventions have we covered? And have you ever tossed to the lead correspondent standing in front of the White House uh, when we say let's go down to the convention floor? But the White House does serve as the backdrop, particularly tonight, and it will uh, in a key form on Thursday with the president. Uh, but we've heard from Tiffany Trump tonight. We'll hear from Eric Trump. We'll hear now from the First Lady Melania Trump from the Rose Garden. And as Mary just mentioned there, she'll portray herself as an immigrant coming to America with a dream of her own. But the First Lady has also been quite independent. She was the first one in this administration to don the mask, uh, to show that image to the American people, somewhat silently sending her message along the way. I'm also fascinated this hour to see Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also uh, pushing the envelope. His critics have said when you leave our country's shores, you're supposed to leave politics behind and serve our country, represent our country. Uh, he says he's uh, speaking for himself tonight from Jerusalem in this taped speech, but a lot of critics say this is not what a Secretary of State should be doing during a political convention. Actually defies the political the guidance he's given to the rest of the State Department. I want to bring in Lindsey Davis as well. This is the highest profile speech of Melania Trump's life and four years ago she did have a problem with her speech when it was found that she had basically copied passages of First Lady Michelle Obama's speech from 2008. Right and there's so much that we don't know uh, really about Melania. I think that she's an enigma for many people and really if you think about what we do know about her quite often uh, we reflect on that moment that the plagiarized speech and also uh, the jacket that said, I really don't care, do you? And also her Be Best campaign, where she uh, is, is, is trying to protect children from being bullied. But again, I think that we are really going to be hearing her personal story tonight about immigration. A lot of scrutiny, certainly, on these 16 minutes tonight. That is coming up. First, we're going to go back to the White House right now. The president is going to be holding a naturalization ceremony in the East Room of the White House. Again, again, one more sign of how he's using the power and trappings of the office at this convention. In fact, earlier this evening, he actually delivered a pardon to a former bank robber who's become an advocate for prisoners and prison reform across the United States. Let's tune back in to the virtual convention floor. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States.
Acting Secretary Wolf, I present to you five candidates for naturalization representing five countries. On behalf of everyone here today, I'd like to express my gratitude to you, Mr. President, for hosting this naturalization ceremony here at the White House. To our candidates, it is my honor to administer the oath of allegiance and welcome you as our fellow citizens. Candidates for naturalization, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I hereby declare, I hereby declare an, oath an oath that I absolutely and entirely, that I absolutely and entirely renounce, and renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, to any foreign prince potentate, potentate, state or sovereignty, state or sovereignty of whom or which, of of whom or which, which I have heretofore been, I heretofore been a subject or citizen, a subject or citizen that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws. The Constitution and laws of the United States of America, of the United States of America, against all enemies, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith, that I will bear true faith, and allegiance to the same, and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms, that I will bear arms, on behalf of the United States, on behalf of the United States, when required by law, when required by law, that I will perform, that I will perform. Non-combatant service, non service in the armed forces of the U.S. In the armed forces of the U.S. When required by law. When required by law. That I will perform work. That I will perform work of national of national importance. Of national importance under civilian direction. Under civilian direction. When required by law. When required by law. And that I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, you're now citizens of the United States. On behalf of the Department of Homeland Security, it is my honor to call you my fellow Americans. Mr. President, I want to again commend you for your dedication to the rule of law and for restoring integrity to our immigration system. Thank you for hosting such a patriotic celebration here at the White House today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, congratulations. That's fantastic. It's really great. Thank you. And I want to thank Acting Secretary Wolf, doing a phenomenal job in so many ways. Today, America rejoices as we welcome five absolutely incredible new members into our great American family. You are now fellow citizens of the greatest nation on the face of God's earth. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Great going. You followed the rules. You obeyed the laws. You learned your history, embraced our values, and proved yourselves to be men and women of the highest integrity. It's not so easy. You went through a lot, and we appreciate you being here with us today. You've earned the most prized, treasured, cherished, and priceless possession anywhere in the world. It's called American citizenship. There is no higher honor and no greater privilege and it's an honor for me to be your president. Thank you very much. President Trump there at the White House. I want to bring in our panel now, Chris Christie, longtime ally of the president, watching that ceremony here at the White House. Extraordinary. Never seen anything like that at a convention, that's for sure. And what a far cry from the announcement speech that President Trump gave when he entered this race at Trump Tower <laughs> now five years ago. <laughs> yeah, far cry from that. And, and listen, COVID has changed everything. It changed the way the Democratic convention looked last week. It's changed this now. Um, the president had to make decisions about where he was going to do these things, and he's decided to do them at the White House. Um, and the fact is that I think no matter where you go in this in this context when you're the president, there's going to be some criticism because of the attendant costs that go about moving the president and the and the Secret Service and all the rest. Well, so again, the, the Hatch Act doesn't apply to the president, but it is against the law to use for government employees to use their job for political purposes. It, there's no there's no question that. that that's the law, George. Um, but it's the president doing what he's doing here, and he's directing it. And the fact is that for him, um, the COVID changes everything. You know that Donald Trump 
would much rather be in that arena in Charlotte, or that stadium in Jacksonville, in with a huge you crowd. Sure? You're or going out on a limb. Now. I'm going to go out on a limb, <laughs> but I'm going to say that's where he'd rather be. So I think this is the best he can do uh, in the in the interim. The same way that I thought what uh, Senator Vice President Biden did last week in Wilmington with the fireworks and people parked there was the best he could do to try to bring some natural human excitement to what they were doing. Ron Emanuel, it is a strategy born of necessity here during the COVID crisis. But you and I were both shaking our heads as we were watching that we served in the White House during a re-election campaign. Mm -hmm. Unimaginable. Again, there was no COVID then. Mm -hmm. Unimaginable you could use the White House. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, in all due respect to putting this on COVID, this is, it is not COVID. This is a president who has always broken the boundaries. He doesn't think the but law applies to But this isn't what he wanted to do tonight. No. Of, of course, but given that, this is, no, he, does he want 100,000 people chanting Trump four more years? Of course, but this is breaking the boundaries of not just a Zoom-like convention. Nobody's ever used the platform of the White House. I mean, nobody envisioned Jacqueline Kennedy's Rose Garden as a platform for where the first lady's gonna you know, talk about her president at a convention speech. So, and they, every notion of a Secretary of State speaking, let alone doing it from a foreign country at the roof of uh, the King David Hotel overlooking the Wailing Wall, I mean, you know, but my view is, I go back to my core question, is this closing the gap of a nine-point well, deficit? And that's the question. I mean, this is for the lawyers. They clearly did not ask their opinion because it's too late already. It violates a lot of laws. That's the question I want to bring to Sarah Fagan because as I was watching that ceremony, it seemed pretty moving. We all like watching people getting yeah. sworn in as citizens. I wonder if, again, a strategy born of necessity, but it may be more effective for the president than another crowd rally with 100,000 people screaming. I think that's exactly right, George. I mean, look, the, the, the constitutional scholars are going to debate this. There's going to be lawsuits tomorrow. Well, there's going to be lawsuits. There's going to be, be lawsuits just, yeah. tomorrow over this. But, but to the point of people watching it at home who don't particularly care where a speech is given, this is a moving moment. These are people who have come into this country who are making contributions, and he's had a the ability to point out like the diversity of America. You know, uh, you saw very diverse faces and people from different backgrounds, and that is the story of America. And he didn't even have to speak very long to make that point. Uh, so I thought it was very effective. Is that? More political pageantry. And I don't know that anybody's buying it. I mean, yes, this is a great ceremony. Yes, we are so excited to welcome these folks here, uh, as we should. But even the words he spoke, you followed the law. You, and I talked about that earlier, him making this juxtaposition against good black and brown people versus uh, bad black and brown people. And are people going to forget the things that he said about immigrants, the fact that he caged kids at the border, um, the fact that uh, he, he considered um, uh, Latin Americans as, as bad hombres? Are people going to look at this and forget that? I don't think so. I don't think he's fooling anybody other than the people who are gullible who suck up everything he says. Cecilia Vega? Well, what the White House is trying to do with this, George, and, and the uh, RNC, frankly, it's to show that the president does support legal immigration. But the reality is that he has slashed that as well. Uh, it was so much so that even the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, the agency that processes things like visa, is on the path to having to furlough all their workers because they're seeing so little business happening right now. Uh, he's still running an anti-immigration campaign, uh, but really, you know, the big picture right now is immigration is low on the list of concerns for voters as we're heading into this election. They're talking about the economy and COVID. And of course, the president also does want to keep on talking about the wall as well. This ceremony is wrapping up right now. The next speaker will be Eric. Trump, the president's younger son. We've already seen Tiffany Trump earlier this evening. Of course, Don Jr. last night. Don Jr., uh, something of an attack dog last night when he was taking on Joe Biden, what he called the radical left Democrats. We'll see what tone Eric Trump it takes tonight. Good evening, America. When I stood on this convention stage four years ago, no one fully understood the historic change that was about to take place. We could all feel it. Something was happening. A movement was forming just below the surface. The forgotten man and woman, voiceless in Washington, D.C., were preparing to rise up. Our movement followed the pattern of so many that came before us. First, we were ignored. Then we were laughed at. Then they fought us. And then, together, we won. From that moment forward, America came first. America started winning again. America became respected again. But with every movement, there's a counter movement. In the view of the radical Democrats, America is the source of the world's problems. As a result, they believe the only path forward is to erase history and forget the past. 
They want to destroy the monuments of our forefathers. They want to disrespect our flag, burn the stars and stripes that represent patriotism and the American dream. They want to disrespect our national anthem by taking a knee while our armed forces lay down their lives every day to protect our freedom. They do not want the Pledge of Allegiance in our schools. Many of them don't want one nation under God. The Democrats want to defund and disrespect our law enforcement. The Democrats want an America where your thoughts and opinions are censored when they do not align with their own. President Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It must be fought for and it must be protected. This is the fight that we are in right now and it is a fight that only my father can win. My father ran not because he needed the job, but because he knew hardworking people across this great country were being left behind. The media mocked these patriots in the flyover states in which they lived. They ignored the Trump flags. They ignored the millions of MAGA banners and barns painted in red, white, and blue. The silent majority had no one fighting for them in either party. Their so-called leaders were bowing to China, bribing Iran, and spending more time worrying about how they'd be received by the elites in Paris than how Americans would provide for their families in Pittsburgh. Our family lost friends, but it only pushed us to fight harder. My father pledged to every American in every city, state, and town that he was going to make America great again. And so began the great American comeback. Almost immediately, taxes were slashed, regulations were cut, and the economy soared to new heights, heights never seen before. Wages went through the roof. Unemployment reached the historic lows, especially for black Americans, Hispanic Americans, and women. Trade deals were ripped up and renegotiated. Lights were turned back on in abandoned factories across our country. Trillions of dollars were repatriated back to the United States, which had been sitting in foreign lands for far too long. Once again, America became the envy of the world. And with that renewed strength came leverage. The president demanded that our allies pay their fair share for the defense of the Western world. My father rebuilt the mighty American military, adding new jets, aircraft carriers. He increased wages for our incredible men and women in uniform. He expanded our military defense budget to $721 billion per year. America was no longer weak in the eye of the enemy. The moment President Trump ordered special forces to kill some of the deadliest terrorists on the planet, the day the mighty Moab was dropped on insurgent camps, is the day America took a stance to never be defeated by the enemy. Al-Baghdadi, Soleimani, dead. Over and over, issue after issue, the economy, the wall, the military, trade deals, tax cuts, Supreme Court justices, VA hospitals, prescription drugs, school choice, right to try, moving the embassy to Jerusalem, peace in the Middle East. Never any wars were finally ended. Promises made and promises for the first time were kept. Most politicians spend their entire careers in Washington, D.C. and get absolutely nothing accomplished. For example, Joe Biden. Joe Biden is a politician who has been in government for 47 years. He's a career politician who's never signed the front of a check and does not know the slightest thing about the American worker or the American business, the engine which fuels the greatest economy the world has ever known. The same politician who has been a total pushover for communist China and someone who would be a giant relief for terrorists who now have spent years running, hiding, and being taken out by the most talented military known to man. Joe Biden has pledged to raise your taxes by $4 trillion. 82% of Americans will see their taxes go up significantly. Biden has pledged to stop border wall construction and give amnesty and health care to all illegal immigrants. Biden has pledged to defund the police and take away your cherished Second Amendment. My father, on the other hand, delivered the largest tax cuts in American history, knows if you do not have a border, you do not have a country, and will always support law enforcement and your right to keep and bear arms. Every day, my father fights for the American people, the forgotten man and woman of this country, the ones who embody the American spirit, which is unlike anything else in the world. It built the New York City skyline. It built the Hoover Dam. 
And soon, under my father's leadership, it will send Americans to Mars. The American spirit can be felt in the majesty of the Grand Canyon, the shadows of Mount Rushmore, and the stillness of the air at Gettysburg. It can be seen in the wide-eyed wonder of every American child as they take their first breath in the greatest country the world has ever known. It defeated fascism, it defeated communism, and in 68 days, it will defeat the empty, oppressive, and radical views of the extreme left. Ronald Reagan's quote ends with this simple warning. One day we could spend our sunset years telling our children what it was once like in the United States where men and women were free. Under President Trump, freedom will never be a thing of the past. That's what a vote for Donald Trump represents. It's a vote for the American spirit, the American dream, and for the American flag. To the law enforcement officer who's being attacked, betrayed, and whose job they are trying to make extinct, my father will fight for you. To all houses of worship and to all people of faith stripped of our religious freedoms and religious liberties, my father will fight for you. To the voiceless, shamed, censored, and canceled, my father will fight for you. To our farmers who work dawn to dust to keep our plates full, my father will fight for you. To every single mother and father, to our veterans, our coal miners, and to the American worker, my father will fight for you. And to every proud American who bleeds red, white, and blue, my father will continue to fight for you. In closing, I'd like to speak directly to my father. I miss working alongside you every single day, but I'm damn proud to be on the front lines of this fight. I'm proud of what you are doing for this country. I'm proud to show my children what their grandfather is fighting for. I'm proud to watch you give them hell. Never stop. Continue to be unapologetic. Keep fighting for what is right. You are making America strong again. You are making America safe again. You are making America proud again. And yes, together with a forgotten man and woman who are finally forgotten no more, you are making America great again. Dad, let's make Uncle Robert very proud this week. Let's go get another four years. I love you very much. God bless you and God bless the United States of America. A couple of grace notes there from Eric Trump at the end of a political speech, remembering his uh, his uncle Robert, who died just in the last couple of weeks, and telling his father, you know, go get him, and I love you. And, and we all, of course, know that Donald Trump is certainly watching in the White House right now. I want to bring in Tom Yamas, who's covered the Trump campaign from the very beginning. And Tom, uh, it's a reminder that in the Trump family, the father's business is the family's business. Donald Trump did it for his father. His children are doing it for him. Right. If Donald Trump is your father, he's the center of your universe. If I've said before this speech you know very personal there at the end pretty much a speech for an audience of one and that audience was president trump but we have to also understand other people who probably loved that speech and that was the maga country the people who really love the president they love eric trump they love don jr and don jr and eric trump are the princesses right in the, in the maga castle and they speak directly to those voters george we just heard about law and order police officers the coal miners they're going to fight for you we, he was talking about sending americans to mars and there's a lot of voters right now that probably want to know if we can send americans back to school it, it was interesting the, the pandemic wasn't brought up I, I don't know if he brought it up at all he was really talking about a lot of issues we heard about in 2016. He was really giving a speech that his father would have loved, people that, again, that are in the MAGA world would have loved. I don't know if he moves the needle with this speech, but basically they have to motivate their base. They have to pump up those voters, and that's what this speech was about. The president probably loved this speech just like he loved his other son, John Jr.'s speech as well. I'm sure that's true, Tommy Thomas. Thanks. Let me bring Terry Moran for more on this as well. Of course, family members are always used at conventions, Terry. There's no question about that. Usually, though, you, they're used to soften up the candidate, humanize the candidate in some way. What we're seeing here are real political speeches.
And, and that is unusual, Giorgio, and it's very characteristic, though, of Trumpism. You talk about a family business, it feels almost sometimes like a ruling family because of that political note in the speeches of the president's children. You don't see that in American politics. As you say, the, the, the family is usually there to humanize or warm up the persona of the candidate. Here, it's something very, very different. And it's also very typical of Trumpism. Trumpism uh, needs an enemy to smite. And the combination of belligerence and scorn that, that the president makes his on Twitter and elsewhere goes right through the movement, and you hear it from his children uh, calling out the opponents of their, of their father in a way that might reek of privilege to some viewers. Well, what warrant does this person have to make that kind of speech, aside from the fact that his daddy is president? Well, and that's the question. Does this work for an incumbent president? Terry Moran, thanks very much. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is coming up. We're going to take a quick break.
The Republican National Convention here again, George Stephanopoulos. And welcome back to our coverage night two of the Republican Convention coming up something we also have never seen before at a political convention and a sitting Secretary of State on a diplomatic mission abroad giving a political speech to the convention. That's what Mike Pompeo is going to do in just a couple of minutes. I want to bring in our Chief Global Affairs anchor Martha Raddatz for more on this. And Martha, the, the Secretary of State is facing quite a bit of heat over this both from inside the department, other diplomats and former diplomats. He certainly is, and he taped this speech in Jerusalem on a diplomatic mission. The RNC said they paid for the crew, they paid for all the equipment used for this. But Secretary Pompeo is basically violating his own policy. In December, he told all political appointees they were prohibited from engaging in political activity in concert with a partisan candidate. Now, Mike Pompeo said originally this was a personal speech, but you really can't separate uh, your from being Secretary of State and give a personal speech in a political situation like this. But all these rules seem to be out the window. I want to point out also, George, that you had Marines in uniform in that naturalization ceremony, which is also prohibited at a political event. Last week, we had a couple of reservists in American Samoa up here. The Democrats said that was a mistake and oversight. This was no mistake tonight. Okay, Mike Pompeo, that is coming up right now on the virtual floor. Daniel Cameron, the Attorney General of Kentucky, his speech will, will go directly into Mike Pompeo's speech. Let's listen in. By a collective faith in our Constitution and laws and the fundamental fairness they represent. We are defenders of life and of individual liberty, and we carry the mantle of Eisenhower and of Reagan to be a force for good in this world and one that must always be reckoned with. That's my Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, that believes America is an indispensable nation, an evergreen tree, standing tall in a turbulent world. And that's why I am voting for Donald Trump for president. Thank you, and God bless. Hi, I'm Mike Pompeo. I'm speaking to you from beautiful Jerusalem looking out over the old city. I have a big job as Susan's husband and Nick's dad. Susan and Nick are more safe and their freedoms more secure because President Trump has put his America First vision into action. It may not have made him popular in every foreign capital, but it's worked. President Trump understands what my great fellow Kansan President Eisenhower said, for all that we cherish and justly desire for ourselves or for our children, the securing of peace is the first requisite. Indeed, the primary constitutional function of the national government is ensuring that your family and mine are safe and enjoy the freedom to live, to work, to learn, and to worship as they choose. Delivering on this duty to keep us safe and our freedoms intact, this president has led bold initiatives in nearly every corner of the world. In China, He's pulled back the curtain on the predatory aggression of the Chinese Communist Party. The president has held China accountable for covering up the China virus and allowing it to spread death and economic destruction in America and around the world. And he will not rest until justice is done. He has ensured that the Chinese Communist Party spies posing as diplomats in America are jailed or sent back to China. And he has ended the ridiculously unfair trade arrangement with China that punched a hole in our economy. Those jobs, those jobs are coming back home. In North Korea, the president lowered the temperature and against all odds got the North Korean leadership to the table. No nuclear tests, no long range missile tests and Americans held captive in North Korea came home to their families as did the precious remains of scores of heroes who fought in Korea. Today, today because of President Trump, NATO is stronger Ukraine has defensive weapon systems, and America left a harmful treaty so our nation can now build missiles to deter Russian aggression. And in the Middle East, when Iran threatened, the president approved a strike that killed the Iranian terrorist Qasem Soleimani. This is the man most responsible for the murder and maiming of hundreds of American soldiers and thousands of Christians across the Middle East. And you'll recall, too, that when the president took office, radical Islamic terrorists had beheaded Americans and ISIS controlled a territory in the size of the size of Great Britain. Today, 
Today, because of the president's determination and leadership, the ISIS caliphate is wiped out. It's gone. Its evil leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is dead. And our brave soldiers, they're on their way home. The president exited the U.S. from the disastrous nuclear deal with Iran and squeezed the Ayatollah, Hezbollah, and Hamas. The president, too, moved the U.S. Embassy to this very city of God, Jerusalem, the rightful capital of the Jewish homeland. And just two weeks ago, the president brokered a historic peace deal between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. This is a deal that our grandchildren will read about in their history books. You know, as a soldier, I saw firsthand people desperate to flee to freedom. The way each of us can best ensure our freedoms is by electing leaders who don't just talk, but who deliver. An American hostage imprisoned in Turkey for two years, Pastor Andrew Brunson, said upon his release that he survived his ordeal with these words of scripture, be faithful, endure, and finish well. If we stay the course, we will. May God richly bless you, and may God bless our great nation, the United States of America. Coming up next, the First Lady of the United States, Melania Trump. You see President Trump entering the Rose Garden for First Lady Melania Trump's speech. A group of invited guests there, somewhat socially distanced, some wearing masks, will hear the First Lady as she gives this speech. We're also having a little bit of breaking news at the convention now, so I want to bring in Cecilia Vega. Cecilia, the, the, we're, the convention had to drop one of the speakers, Marianne Mendoza, earlier this evening because it turned out that earlier today she was spreading an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Yeah, George, this is one of those so-called uh, angel moms whose son was killed by an undocumented an immigrant, as you said at the last minute, she was crossed off the agenda, uh, not invited because she encouraged her followers it to read this, uh, frankly, a very vile anti-Semitic Twitter thread. But um, there are a number of people with extreme views who've been invited to participate in this convention this week. Uh, there's a public school teacher who's claimed that public schools use curriculum to groom children to be sexual predators. A, a couple of different people who are supporters of this QAnon conspiracy group. Uh, you know, frankly, it, it echoes in some ways what you see on the president's Twitter thread every day. This this support of these free fringe ideas and conspiracy theories. What has struck me so far, George, is the very few references that we've heard from coronavirus, from, to the coronavirus from any of the speakers that we've, we've heard so far this evening. But now it's time for the headline of this evening, First Lady Melania Trump. Let's listen in. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the First Lady of the United States, Mrs. Melania Trump. Lady, give me a little bit of a smile for the cameras as she prepares to give the most important political speech of her life. She hasn't given that many. She's led the Be Best campaign in the White House. Tonight, speaking on behalf of the re-election of her husband. Like just yesterday that we were at our first convention where my husband accepted the Republican nomination and then became our 45th President of the United States. Yet the energy and enthusiasm for who should lead this nation, it is real today as it was four years ago. I know I speak for my husband and the entire family when I say we have not forgotten the incredible people who were willing to take a chance on the businessmen who had never worked in politics. We know it was you who elected him to be commander in chief. And we know it is you who will carry us through again. We were humbled by the incredible support then and we are still grateful today. I want to acknowledge the fact that since March, our lives have changed drastically. The invisible enemy, COVID-19, swept across our beautiful country and impacted all of us. My deepest sympathy goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one. And my prayers are with those who are ill or suffering. I know many people are anxious and some feel helpless. I want you to know you are not alone. My husband's administration will not stop fighting until there is an effective treatment or vaccine available to everyone. Donald will not rest until he has done all he can to take care of everyone impacted by this terrible pandemic. I want to extend my gratitude to all of the healthcare professionals, frontline workers and teachers who stepped up in these difficult times. Despite the risk to yourselves and your own families, you put our country first, and my husband and I are grateful. I have been moved by the way Americans have come together in such an unfamiliar, an often frightening situation. It is in times like this that we will look back and tell our grandchildren that through kindness and compassion, strength and determination, we were able to restore the promise of our future. Businesses stepped up and volunteers stepped in. People were eager to share ideas, resources, and support of all kinds with neighbors and strangers alike. It has been inspiring to see what the people of our great nation will do for one another, especially when we are at our most fragile. Speaking of strength and determination, we recently celebrated the 100-year anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Yesterday, on the North Lawn of the White House, we unveiled an exhibit dedicated to women's suffrage. The exhibit called on children from across the country to send art honoring the meaning of this important time in women's history. When I was judging the entries, I reflected on the impact of women's voices 
in our nation's story and how proud I will be to cast my vote again for Donald this November. We must make sure that women are heard and that the American dream continues to thrive. Growing up as a young child in Slovenia, which was under communist rule at the time, I always heard about an amazing place called America, a land that stood for freedom and opportunity. As I grew older, it became my goal to move to the United States and follow my dream of working in the fashion industry. My parents worked very hard to ensure our family could not only live and prosper in America, but also contribute to a nation that allows for people to arrive with a dream and make it reality. I want to take the moment to thank my mother and father for all they have done for our family. It is because of you that I'm standing here today. I arrived in the United States when I was 26 years old. Living and working in the land of opportunity was a dream come true, but I wanted more. I wanted to be a citizen. After 10 years of paperwork and patience, I studied for the test in 2006 and became an American citizen. It is still one of the proudest moments in my life because with hard work and determination, I was able to achieve my own American dream. As an immigrant and a very independent woman, I understand what a privilege it is to live here and to enjoy the freedoms and opportunities that we have. As First Lady, I have been fortunate to see the American dream come true over and over again. I have met many inspiring women, children, parents, and families who have overcome life-changing issues that include addiction, homelessness, family members who are ill or have passed away, abuse of all kinds, and many other challenges that would make most people give up. The past three and a half years have been unforgettable. There are no words to describe how honored, humbled, and fortunate I am to serve our nation as your First Lady. After many of the experiences I've had, I don't know if I can fully explain how many people I take home with me in my heart each day. From brave soldiers who give up so much so that we can be free, to children of all circumstances who I have met around the world, thank you for inspiring me. It is my greatest honor to serve you. When I speak to members of the military, despite sacrificing time with their families, experience the fear of war or suffering loss, they have no regrets about serving our country. The same goes for their families and the families of first responders who often watch their loved ones walk out the door, not sure if or when they will come home. When I speak to families who have lost someone, the pain mixed with pride I hear in their voices is something I think about often. So thank you to all who serve our country in the military and as first responders. And thank you to the families who wait for them. You are all heroes in your own right. I have also been moved by the many children and families I've spent time with at hospitals, schools, and other locations around the world. Children who are dealing with pain or illness that would break even the strongest adult. Parents who are grateful to wake up every day and see that their child is still alive. These families are a testament to what faith and medicine strength and science can do. 
On my first international trip as First Lady, my husband and I visited places of great significance to the three major religions, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. One special memory from that trip is of a young boy I had privilege of visiting while at Bambino Gesù Hospital in Rome, Italy. While there, I read the little boy a story and learned that he and his family had been waiting for a heart for a very long time, and he had a grim prognosis. His situation brought my staff and me to tears, and we spoke of a little else as we flew to Belgium for the next part of our trip. Upon landing just a few hours later, we learned that a heart had been donated and would be going to the little one. I think about him often, along with so many amazing and strong young patients across our own country. More profound and sadly unavoidable examples of our country's strength and character have occurred in the communities that have been impacted by natural disasters. Hurricanes, tornadoes, and flooding may show the ugly side of Mother Nature, but in their aftermath, they can show us a beautiful side of humanity. My husband and I have visited many places that have been affected by natural disaster, and we are deeply moved by the strength of the people who have lost everything and the kindness of neighbors and communities. The common thread in all of these challenging situations is the unwavering resolve to help one another. I recognize the stories I just told about people who survive extraordinary circumstances. But Donald and I are also inspired by the millions of Americans who wake up each day with a simple yet courageous goal of providing for their families and keeping them safe. You are the backbone of this country. You are the people who continue to make the United States of America what it is and who have the incredible responsibility of preparing our future generations to leave everything even better than they found it. Just as you are fighting for your families, my husband, our family, and the people in this administration are here fighting for you. No matter the amount of negative or false media headlines or attacks from the other side, Donald Trump has not and will not lose focus on you. He loves this country and he knows how to get things done. As you have learned over the past five years, he's not a traditional politician. He doesn't just speak words. He demands action and he gets results. The future of our country has always been very important to him. And it is something that I have always admired. In fact, it is to help ensure a better future for our next generation that I launched Be Best my initiative to help children achieve their fullest potential. Be Best has one simple goal, teaching youth about the importance of their well-being, both mentally and physically. This also includes understanding online safety and the dangers of opioid and drug abuse. Through Be Best, my office and I have been able to highlight people, programs, and organizations that are doing extraordinary things in our country and around the world. I continue, I continue to believe that by shining a light on these positive examples, others across the country and globe will become inspired to do their part for our next generation. Helping children is not a political goal. It is our moral imperative. When I think back to a defining moment of Be Best, my mind goes to a trip I took to Africa. On that vast and beautiful continent, I was able to visit the countries of Ghana, Malawi, Kenya, and Egypt. One of those visits in particular 
had a profound impact on me. Ghana on the coast of West Africa was the first stop on my trip and I experienced firsthand its warm people and their traditions. While there, I visited the Cape Coast Castle and learned more about the beginning of a cruel and often deadly journey in the era of the slave trade. I was horrified when I listened to the guide tell me so many inhumane stories and I gained new perspectives. It is time in our history. We must never forget so that we can ensure that it never happens again. Like all of you, I have reflected on the racial unrest in our country. It is a harsh reality that we are not proud of parts of our history. I encourage people to focus on our future while still learning from our past. We must remember that today we are all one community comprised of many races, religions, and ethnicities. Our diverse and storied history is what makes our country strong, and yet we still have so much to learn from one another. With that in mind, I like to call on the citizens of this country to take a moment, pause, and look at things from all perspectives. I urge people to come together in a civil manner so we can work and live up to our standard American ideals. I also ask people to stop the violence and looting being done in the name of justice and never make assumptions based on the color of a person's skin. Instead of tearing things down, tearing things down let's reflect on our mistakes. Be proud of our evolution and look to our way forward. Every day, let us remember that we are one nation under God and we need to cherish one another. My husband's administration has worked to try and effect change when it comes to issues around race and religion in this country. He's the first president to address a special session of the United Nations General Assembly to call upon countries across the world to end religious persecution and honor the right of every person to worship as they choose. He has made substantial investments in our historically black colleges and universities. This president also continues to fight for school choice, giving parents more options to help their children flourish. My husband knows how to make a real change. From the day that I met him, he has only wanted to make this country the best it can be. For many years, I watched him grow concerned and frustrated, and I'm so proud to see the many things he has done in such a short time. America is in his heart. So while at times we only see the worst of people and politics on the evening news, let's remember how we come together in the most difficult times. And while debate rage on about issues of race, let's focus on the strides we have made and work together for a better tomorrow for everyone. Our administration has also devoted historic resources and produced life-saving results by raising awareness around opioid addiction and drug abuse, especially for children. When so often the headlines are filled with gossip, I want to take this moment to encourage the media to focus even more on the nation's drug crisis. This disease is one that affects everybody. It pays no attention to race, age, or socioeconomic status. Addiction has touched every part of our society in some way. And now more than ever, we have programs and medicine to combat it. We just need to talk about it openly. And you, the media, have the platforms to make that happen. 
to the media industry and as a country. I ask that we all commit to helping in our fights against drug addiction by talking about it even more. Especially as we battle the COVID pandemic, we need to remember that suicides are on the rise as people who are struggling with loneliness and addiction feel they have nowhere to turn. Parents, please talk to your children, teachers and caregivers. Pay attention to signs of addiction. Lawmakers, pass legislation that allows those who ask for help to do so safely and without fear and to provide resources for organizations that help people impacted by addiction. When the stigma is removed, people will no longer be ashamed to ask for help and lives will be saved. And if, if you are struggling with addiction, there is no shame in your illness. Please seek help, you are worth it. In my next four years as First Lady, I will continue to build upon the best and work with individual states to pass legislation to take care of our most vulnerable. I plan to continue the work I have started with children in foster care, as well as the minority communities and tribal nations. I want to ensure children are being protected and communities have the resources needed to combat drug addiction and child neglect or abuse. Like my husband and the administration, I will continue to encourage education that supports a child's individual needs. It is vital that children are given the building blocks to succeed. I also look forward to continue my work to restore the People's House, which is a lasting symbol of pride for our nation. I believe this iconic home needs to be cared for and preserved so it can be enjoyed by the people of this country and visitors from around the world for years to come. I'm passionate about this beautiful house, the grounds, and all they represent. And now I have a special message for the mothers of this country. This modern world is moving so fast and our children face challenges that seem to change every few months. Just like me, I know many of you watch how mean and manipulative social media can be. And just like me, I'm sure many of you are looking for answers how to talk to your children about the downside of technology and their relationships with their peers. Like every parent in this country, I feel there are so many lessons to teach our son and responsibilities as his mother, but there are just not enough hours in the day to do it all. I remind myself that I'm more fortunate than most and still have days that I look for wisdom and strength to do the very best I can for him. To mothers and parents everywhere, you are warriors. In my husband, you have a president who will not stop fighting for you and your families. I see how hard he works each day and night, and despite the unprecedented attacks from the media and opposition, he will not give up. In fact, if you tell him he cannot be done, he just works harder. <laughs> Donald, <laughs> Donald is a husband who supports me in all that I do. He has built an administration with an unprecedented number of women in leadership roles and has fostered an environment where the American people are always the priority. He welcomes different points of view and encourages thinking outside of the box. I know I speak for my husband and the family when I say we are so grateful that you have trusted him to be your president. And we will be honored to serve this incredible country for four more years. As you have heard this evening, I don't want to use this precious time attacking the other side. Because as we saw last week, 
that kind of talk only serves to divide the country further. I'm here because we need my husband to be our president and commander in chief for four more years. He is what is best for our country. We all know Donald Trump makes no secrets about how he feels about things. Total honesty is what we as citizens deserve from our president. Whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. And that is because he's an authentic person who loves this country and its people and wants to continue to make it better. Donald wants to keep your family safe. He wants to help your family succeed. He wants nothing more than for this country to prosper and he doesn't waste time playing politics. Almost four years ago, we went into election day completely underestimated. Despite what is being said again this year, I know, just as you do, that Americans will go to the polls and vote on the behalf of their families, our economy, our national security, and our children's future. To vote for those ideals is not a partisan vote. It is a common sense vote because those are goals and hopes that we all believe in. I believe that we need my husband's leadership now more than ever in order to bring us back once again to the greatest economy and the strongest country ever known. God bless you all, your families, and God bless the United States of America. First lady Melania Trump there in the Rose Garden wrapping up her speech to the Republican National Convention. Something that's never happened before right there will now be greeted by her husband Donald Trump who sat quietly beaming through that whole 20 minute speech. It was a personal speech warm in places but also had a tone of quiet defiance. The First Lady speaking, unlike many of the other speakers at this convention, she, when she referred to the coronavirus, she actually called it COVID-19. The proper term did not refer to it as the, as the China virus and spoke to all the people suffering, saying, you are not alone. She also spoke to those struggling with addiction, asking them to go seek help. Uncharacteristically talked about the racial unrest in this country as well, in a way different from so many other speakers at this convention. She talked about the moments of American history we're not necessarily proud of, how we have to learn from that history as we focus on the future. Also called on every American to pause and consider the perspectives of one another. Clearly, she was speaking to the women of America. She talked to the moms directly, calling them warriors, and defended her husband in uncompromising terms. Mary Bruce, it was a scene unlike any other we've seen in this White House, and we've said that so many times before. It is still just remarkable. You know, we can hear the applause here behind us, but just to see the First Lady in this setting delivering this speech, and she did deliver on what was promised. This was an uplifting, forward-looking speech. The First Lady making many appeals uh, to women, to families in this country, especially uh, during this uncertain time. I was struck by how much of this speech was really about Melania Trump making the case for what she would do with another four years in the White House, hitting over and over again on on the causes that are most dear to her heart, fighting for children, trying to tackle uh, addiction going forward uh, and abuse, and also struck by what was not really included in this speech. You know, so often when you hear from the First Lady, it's a chance uh, to share personal anecdotes about the president, to show a side of him that maybe the public doesn't know, to speak about him as a family man. You didn't hear so many of those anecdotes, but what you did hear was her coming very, you know, fierce, fiercely, but also subtly in her own way to her husband's defense, making a forceful case for him in a way that, uh, that really only she can. Yeah, Mary Bruce, thanks for David, David Muir. There's no question about that. Also, again, not a terribly political speech in most places, but those two references to the other side, kind of discordant.
Absolutely, she did talk. She said, I'm not going to speak about the other side as other speakers have, but I, I think what you saw, George, was her independent streak on full display tonight. As you mentioned, she did something that the other speakers, these first two nights at the convention, uh, did not do. She spoke at length about what we're seeing in this country, the racial unrest. She acknowledged that in her trip to Africa, that she heard stories about the slave trade, that she was deeply moved by it. She said she's reflected on the racial unrest in our country. And as you mentioned, George, she urged citizens of this country to take a pause and actually think about this from other people's perspective. She said stop the violence and looting terms we've heard over the past couple of nights and she said never make assumptions about uh, people based on the color of their skin. And as you mentioned, George, she, she talked about coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 obviously, but she said I have sympathy for everyone who's lost a loved one. I know you're anxious, you're not alone. She said my husband will not stop fighting. These were two areas that we heard uh, not as much from if at all, from the other members of the Trump family. As Mary said, few personal anecdotes. She didn't offer personal anecdotes either, but this was definitely a defense of her husband and, and a plea for four more years from the people who get elected him the first time. Lindsey Davis, the, 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 the section on race was, I think, in one of the ways, some of the ways most striking part of the speech, especially when she talked about the past and learning from the past. Of course, we're reminded that the president on many occasions has praised the Confederate flag and gotten in the middle of that entire controversy. Yeah, I thought it was interesting and unique um, when she talked specifically about going to West Africa and experiencing and hearing the stories about what happened. She also talked about how her husband has given money uh, to HBCUs. I think that this uniquely was her voice, which was probably very intentional also because she wanted to shy away from the controversy uh, from the last time she spoke at a Republican National Convention. Uh, it seemed to me that she was really trying to make an appeal uh, not only to the suburban mothers uh, but also to uh, immigrants. We did, while she wasn't so personal about uh, her really, her husband and giving the anecdotes about her about him, uh, she really did want to portray him as a fighter, as a leader, as somebody who was honest, but then did give her own personal story as far as uh, being an immigrant and growing up in communist Slovenia, Slovenia and really coming uh, to America as like the land of opportunity in her path to uh, citizenship. And then at the end, she said, and I have a special message for the mothers. Of course, we know that uh, Vice President Biden leads by 13 points with suburban uh, women compared to Trump. So it'll remain to be seen if that appeal uh, helps her husband. Biggest speech of her life, Lindsay Davis, thanks very much. We're gonna return now to our regular programming. For many of you, that is late local news. Of course, Nightline is coming up as well. And I'll see you tomorrow on GMA. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else.
Good evening, everyone. We are joined now by Chris Christie, the former governor of New Jersey, Rahm Emanuel, the former mayor of Chicago, ABC News contributor Yvette Simpson, and Republican strategist Sarah Fagan. First Lady Melania Trump spoke about embodying the American dream, immigrating to the U.S., and, and working to accomplish her dreams. Does her speech tonight make her and the president more appealing to some of the women who may have dropped off? Governor Chris Christie, how'd she do? Listen, I've known her for 17 years. That's her. Um, she was direct. She was honest. She was herself, uniquely herself. And you saw the content in that speech was different than anything else you've heard. Um, that's because she wrote it. Uh, and I thought she delivered it well. I thought she delivered it sincerely. And I, I've always thought for the last three and a half years that uh, she is simply the best a surrogate that the president has. I think he hasn't used her as much as he should. I think part of that's her choice. Um, but I also think that in the next 70 days, uh, he should use her as much as he possibly can uh, because she speaks for that, this administration in a way that is much more persuasive than a lot of the other voices I've heard. And tonight we saw a steady stream of women speaking out in support of President Trump, and yet suburban women currently favor Biden by 13 points. Sarah, what does the president have to do in order to try to win over more of those suburban women voters? Well, I think we need to see more speeches like the one we heard from Melania Trump. I think uh, the First Lady also did something that is was very effective, and I think it needs to be part of the Trump uh, case to America, which is she was very subtle about it. She made a joke. She said, yeah, I, you know, I know you don't like what he says. You know, you're going to hear what he says whether you like it or not. And, and people chuckled in, in the audience. But set that aside. That doesn't really matter. Twitter doesn't matter. What matters is he goes out there and fights every day. He delivers. He, he accomplishes tax cuts and deregulation and progress in the Middle East and all of these things because he fights and he gets it done. And that has got to be a theme with women, which is to say, I know you don't like him. I know you don't appreciate his tone, but what matters is what he delivers. Yvette, politics aside, was it a good speech? Look, I want to live in the world that Melania Trump talked about. That is not her husband's America. Trump, that is not Trump's America. It is like most of this convention, it's, it's devoid of reality, it's performance, it's rhetoric, it's empty words. Just like, I mean, and I think that's the challenge with Melania, you get this inconsistency with her. She says she cares about kids and she's got the jacket. You know, I don't care how about you when she's going down to see kids in cages. She says we shouldn't be, we should be teaching our kids not to bully. And she's married to the bully in chief. And so that's the problem with, I think, not just Melania's speech today, but what we're hearing a lot. It is devoid from reality. If it was real, we would all embrace it. And, and, and I don't believe that people believe it, particularly people who are, who are drowning under the weight of this man's policies, the people who are really suffering under this pandemic, the folks out in the streets right now who are rallying against racial unrest and injustice. It just does not jive with what you're hearing. And what people want to know is the truth. They're not getting that. Tonight, several of the speakers continue to use language describing Joe Biden as far left and radical, suggesting that a vote for Biden will equate to supporting socialism and a leftist radical agenda. Rom, how does Biden uh, avoid getting painted with the same brush? Well, I, I don't think it's going to work when you're, you're not exactly, and I think I said this the other day, his speech both introduced himself and inoculated himself from that attack. You have a son in the military. People know him as Joe Biden. They know him by his first name. That's an intimate connotation. So I don't think that Joe Biden of a son with the military, somebody anchored both in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania, and the Catholic Church is a guy up in the uh, foothills of Cuba with Fidel Castro Che Guevara in a camouflage outfit. I do want to pick up on something Sarah said, if I can, about the speech, because I actually think uh, she did a very good job. And the reason is, Successful campaigns take a negative and turn it into an affirmative. She took all the things you don't like about Donald Trump, the rough edges, et cetera, and said, that's an honest man. And a successful campaign takes all your stripes, positive and negative, and takes the negatives and makes them work for you. And the other thing is, she is the best surrogate because people know if this is somebody he would marry with these values, these ideals, and this heart, he can't be that man, a bad a man. And so, by just talking about what motivates her and cares about her, he gets that glow by standing next to her. And 
it was not the best of first lady speeches, et cetera, when you can look at other things, but it was an effective first lady speech because he gets the benefit of people liking her. It's a side, it's a bank shot, but it worked. The economy, of course, continues to suffer greatly over the past few months with tens of millions of Americans applying for unemployment benefits. Governor Christie, would you say that he's been able to paint the picture of himself as the leader who can now dig himself and dig all of us out of this mess? Yeah, I think, in fact, all the polls show that, too. He still has the advantage over Joe Biden, and it's the only category that he has the advantage over Joe Biden is on the economy. And the reason for that is twofold. One, it's his background. They elected him for that reason um, in the main as a businessman who they thought would be able to restore the economy to greater growth and he did um, and I think now they think he could use those very same skills to bring the country back and they trust him more than they trust Joe Biden on that and and I think as to what Rob talked about before the inoculation in the speech I think that's absolutely true that Biden did a lot to inoculate himself and the, but the only way that inoculation stays is if he doesn't talk anymore you know, now we're going to see in the Democratic Party what Joe Biden's going to say when he eventually starts to talk. Is he going to sound like more like Rom, or is he going to sound more like a vet? And when that happens, that's going to cause a bit of a schism in the Democratic Party, depending on which one he chooses. And and we don't have that problem. Which one do you think he's going to choose? You know, I think in his heart he's Rom. But, you know, he signed an agreement saying he was going to be like a vet with Bernie Sanders. So I don't know which way it's going to go. I'm going to be fascinated to watch him. What I've urged the president is to start talking about your vision of the future so that Joe Biden has to talk specifically about his. And if he does, he's going to have to make a choice. It, it, the, same, the same thing. Uh, we talked a little about this last night. This campaign is still, or this rather, the convention. I want credit for what I did before COVID hit. It cannot be retrospective credit. It has to be a touchstone for credibility Agreed. about the future, and there's still no future. He's got to do it Thursday night. He's got to do it Thursday night. And if, if he, he doesn't, doesn't, he misses. Big he miss. miss. Big swing and a miss if he yes. doesn't. Lindsay, yep. I, I also want to talk about, to, to the governor's point, it depends on who we're trying to talk to. I still think that both parties are trying to talk to this narrow group of people who could move one side or the other. And I think for the millions of people who are suffering under the weight of this pandemic, I don't think anybody's talking to them the way that they need to be talked to. And I think that's the mistake of this campaign, because we know that every election is decided by the people who don't show up. 2016 was decided by the folks who don't show up, and they are the largest plurality of voters, 42 percent. And if nobody's reaching them at a time when they really need to hear a positive message, they're not going to show but up. But so what about the they will? Well, well, we all know that is, a, that is a fair point except for one thing. Every primary, every general election starting from 2018 and in this process, there has been higher turnout than ever before. Turnout is going to hit yes. historic Everyone's voting. You had a midterm election that was turnout level of a presidential election. Everyone is voting, and I, I don't disagree with your premise. I just don't agree with the conclusion of that premise. It, it, but Yvette, I wanted to bring back that John Ponder moment when uh, earlier tonight, at the beginning of the event, um, Biden, uh, uh, President Trump had that surprise pardon for John Ponder, who was the, the convicted bank robber. Um, in many ways, you were talking about how you saw that as a draw for black voters. Is that effective? You know, I think for most black folks, that looks like performance. It's like, I've got a best friend who's black. I just pardoned a black man. And it does not work. Uh, and, and again, I don't even think it's for black people. I think the objective, I think the objective is to make him mm -hmm. seem like he has black people who support, support him or he supports black people. This is for the suburban white women now, who, who think he's too racist. Now, not every one of these individuals is a token. With all due respect, nobody forced them to, to come up and speak at this convention. These are folks who have a different view on how to solve problems in America. He is a politician and he knows he only has 8% of black people. Please, this is so orchestrated and he can't get them any other way than to show people standing with him. They're and yes, get, let, pardon event. me, I'll They're stand elected. up next to you. Absolutely, give me a car, I'll stand up next to you. And this man, guess what? He deserves more dignity than that, than to be paraded around during a convention with a big sign up, we let you out because you did a good thing. He deserves respect. He He's being paraded. He wasn't pardoned by Barack Obama, he was pardoned by Donald Trump. 
This guy could have been pardoned by Barack Obama, and he was not. He was pardoned by Donald Trump, and I think that's what his family appreciates. And they don't appreciate him being made a political symbol by a vet of something that he clearly was not. He chose to be there tonight, and this Donald Trump gave him his name back tonight. Uh, that is all the time we have for tonight. Thanks so much for joining our first our, our coverage of the Republican convention. We'll be right back here tomorrow starting at 7 p.m. Have a good night.